Hi, Christine. Hi, Liz. Can you hear me? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Well, that's not a great start, is it? Can anybody hear me? Yes, I can. I oh, can. No Hi, Malcolm. Lovely. Hi, Christine. Hi, Key. Hi. And we've got uh, Liz and uh, Karen on as well. Welcome both. I've just been out for a walk at lunchtime and um, <clears throat> the uh, the weather was nice, but uh, not warm enough to attract any butterfly spotters outdoors, I don't think, today. Which is uh, Still quite a good, cold. a good sign. <laughs> Tuesday's up to uh, 23 degrees on Tuesday. That's amazing, isn't it? I saw that. It's um, crazy. It's certainly the, uh, waking, waking, up, waking up a fair few more, I should think. Yeah. Hopefully. No, it's been, I think it's been a fairly, fairly average start to the year so far. There's been, um, Trouble, the weather keeps changing, doesn't it? You know, the, yes. it's, the, yeah. it's a very windy day today. I went out running this morning. It was very, quite chilly. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm hope, hoping Andrew Wood's going to join us in a little while to um, help um, talk us through how uh, Butterfly's been doing so far this year. Okay. Did you go? Did you see the meeting this morning? Did you go? Did you tune into the meeting? The BC meeting. You mean, are you meaning the National Recorders meeting? Yeah. Yeah. No, I didn't. Oh, okay. It's quite interesting. I went. I tuned in. Yeah, no, too busy getting ready for this one, I'm afraid. Yeah, I suspect it probably will be. <laughs> There's a lot to do in a day, isn't it? No, it's um, an unfortunate clash of dates. Now, oh, there's Andrew joining now. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Malcolm. Ooh. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Yeah, I dipped out of the uh, county butterfly recorders meeting. I think I heard the most important bits. So you have my full attention. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we were just we we're just saying it doesn't. It's not a not a not a very warm day outside today. So that should should be good for encouraging butterfly spotters to come come to the meeting rather than uh, go out butterfly spotting. Let's hope so. It's always a risk. I think I can see Liz is just posting a link to the uh, branch annual review into the uh, into the chat box. So I'm I'm going to be talking about the annual review later, but not going through it all in detail. Just um, picking out a few highlights. So if anyone wants to um, catch up on the contents of it, then um, you do you can you can do so. I think just by clicking on the link in the chat box, um, you should be able to still read it while uh, listening to. Um, listening to the call. Hi, Brian. Hi, buddy. Hello, Brian. Hi, everybody. So we have the most beautiful butterfly day here, and I have to sit inside and listen to this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Where's it? I, I'm, I, I'm I think happy he's to... in Austin. I think he's in America, actually. Yeah, I ha yeah it's right. Go oh. away, people. Not you. Oh. <laughs> yeah. How's your day? Is it is it a nice day? 
it's not not warm enough for butterfly spotting. I think that's the most important thing. I see. Well, I have raven that comes to a spot, and and every day I go and feed it an egg, and it shows up and eats eggs. <laughs> That's my kick today. Do you have any swallows around yet? Hi, Karen. Nice Hi. to see you. Hello, everybody. No, we haven't, we haven't had any swallows. Not yet. Oh, OK. <clears throat> well, I was going have... to ask um, Andrew if he could update us a bit on what's, uh, what's been seen flying so far in uh, parts of Middlesex this year, butterfly-wise. Yeah, sure. Um, it's been a pretty slow year, really, because um, the winter was the sort of winter up to the last week of February was pretty cold, and about the only thing that was seen was um, a peacock on the 21st of January. Then we had a warm spell at the end of February where we got brimstone, comma, small tortoiseshell, and red admiral all noted in that last week of February, um, and then it went very quiet again to about the 9th of March. And then it's quiet again for the 19th of March. It's been a, it's been a lot of cold, dull, wet spells uh, this, this early spring. Um, since the, the beginning of this week, though, there's been a fair trickle, trickle of records in every day because you'd expect the hibernators to have finally emerged from hibernation simply because of day length as much as anything. So I know, I know Malcolm's still got some of her, his hibernating butterflies in his shed. Um, but since then, we've also had three more species noted. Uh, Liz saw the small white in her garden on the 21st of March. And there was an orange tip uh, reported on the 22nd of March. And, uh, March orange tips are uh, still quite um, an unusual thing. Um, and then I was looking on iRecord this morning, and there's a record of a holly blue from the 15th of March in Hackney. So we've actually got, uh, I think it's what, eight species <coughs> are uh, flying, which is, is reasonably respectable for coming up to the end of March. Um, but uh, with the weather that's forecast for next week, particularly Monday, Tuesday, and into Wednesday, um, who knows what we might see. It might even be some migrants coming in with the sort of temperature that could be up in the low 20s um, on Tuesday. So it uh, could be a very interesting few days at the beginning of next week. Um, and as we don't have to, as uh, we've got a few res movement restrictions lifted as well from Monday, um, everyone should be out there keeping an eye on things and uh, seeing what we might see. And we may yet turn it round to make it an absolutely fabulous March for butterflies. You never know. Trouble is, first of April, first day for transit recording, the temperature plummets again to about ten degrees, and then stays around about nine or ten degrees for the next next. Uh, 10 days or so according to the long range weather forecast, which is just about absolutely typical. So uh, that's where we are at the moment. <coughs> now, well, that sounds um, sounds like it's quite a good start to the season. I must say, my as you said, my hibernating butterflies, most of them are still in hibernation. There's only about 30% of them come out so far. Um, so it's quite... Um, quite early days in the season yet and I've, um, I'm working next week when uh, I think Keith said it was going to be 23 degrees on Tuesday um, and then I'm on holiday the next week when it's cold so <laughs> that's usually, usually a good way of uh, spotting um, spotting when butterfly weather is going to be good when I when I book holidays. I've got um, yeah we've got some more people joining for, the, for those that are just joining I think Liz has um, posted a copy of the uh, a link to the branch review in, in the chat box. Um, if you, I'm going to be speaking about that a little bit um, when we get into the meeting, but only touching on a few aspects of it. So if you haven't read it and you want to, um, then th there's a link in there that will take you to it on the branch website. Um, and we, we're happy to, to answer any questions on it as we, um, as we, as we go through the formal business. I've got, um, I can see Roger Gibbons has joined as well. Roger, um, you're talking to us uh, in a few days' time on the subject of the French connection, um, which um, sounds intriguing. I thought you might like to just um, spend a couple of minutes uh, explaining to people exactly what that means. 
Yes, it's um, you, you're not going to see Gene Hackman in it, and you've got nothing to do with drugs. So sorry to disappoint you. Um, yeah, the, the the talks have gone extremely well. They've been very well supported. So given that our um, uh, Zoom license runs out fairly soon, we decided to add one more talk, squeeze one more in. Um, this one is going to be slightly different. It's, it's basically a meander through France, um, but not something that will be um, unfamiliar, because in each case, we're going to start with a familiar British species and look at the species in France, which are clearly related to it, and um, have a look at their um, sort of uh, ecology and how they're, how they're separated. Things like um, uh, looking at brimstone and Cleopatra, um, etc. Looking at um, uh, some of the questions about the ecology, uh, which I don't pretend to have the answers to. I mean, for instance, why uh, swallowtail is limited to the Norfolk Broads in England, and yet it's it's common in yeah. France, uh, even on up to 2,000 metres altitude and beyond, above. Um, marsh fritillary, for instance, which um, is fairly uh, uh, limited in Britain, uh, but in France there are five different subspecies which all look completely different uh, and uh, at least one of those is uh, a very high altitude, 2,000 metres plus. Um, I don't, I don't pretend to have the answer to these questions and one question that I've always scratched my head on is there's a butterfly called the Ottoman Brassy Ringlet related to the Scotch Argus which only flies on Mont Lozère in the Cévennes in south central France and in the Balkans. Uh, were they ever connected? So there's more questions than answers, but it will be an illustrated talk, uh, lots of pictures, lots of questions. Hopefully it'll be a sort of an interesting way to sort of finish the, um, the talk season. Thank you. Jim is said that's on, at, uh, that's on Wednesday this week, at, um, starting at, uh, at eight o'clock. So everyone's very welcome to, um, to tune in for that as well. I think as with, as with the other two, we'll be recording it and um, and putting a, a recording link on the branch website homepage um, afterwards. So if, if you can't make it on uh, on Wednesday, it will be there uh, to watch afterwards if, if you if you want to. So Malcolm and company, um, did you have any influence with the biggest shots in butterfly conservation? Can you get them to produce some? pins, some pin badges, because I have all the RSPB pin badges for butterflies. In fact, I have lots and lots of RSPB pin badges. But uh, I wanted to get something for butterfly conservation. And I really, I, I can't stand the t-shirts that they make. So um, I, I don't know. I just, I think we should have a bunch of pins. People can wear them proudly. I don't know who to talk to about that. It's not a branch thing, it's a national I think um, Goldie might be able to answer you on that one. Um, uh, no. Karen, can you answer that one? Well, not, not, I, there are pin badges, I know that. Um, oh, I didn't see. I, I thought they had some. They had some. I don't know if they've, you're, you're, you, you've heard that they've run out, have you? Well, I, I, I looked someplace that they, there were four originally and they don't have them anymore. And, and it doesn't say anything about plans to bring them back. Just as I said, dreadful T-shirts. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not. It's not an area where it's not a area where butterfly conservation majors producing these things. Um, it's not like the RSPB. They don't have that ability. But uh, I, maybe they aren't in, um, continuing them because they weren't that popular or weren't used. Okay. Um, I, if you if you want, I mean, Malcolm. Um, if anybody uh, that's listening has some that they don't want, <laughs> I'll buy them from you. Yeah, no, I'll, well, I'll, I'll check. I'll check whether we've got some. We've still got some stock of when we used to do more sales goods. Um, yeah, I'll yeah. Brian, and let you know if we've got any. Okay, stock. okay, good. I can, I can send an email to um, to 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 my um, governance assistant who who I work. There with. we go. Thank you very much. I'll do that and uh, ask her Thank if you. there are any left. There were lots last year when I saw them. Yeah. Well, uh, welcome to everyone that's just joining. I'm gonna, just going to share the uh, share my screen in a minute, so um, people joining know they've come to the right place. Um, we're going to start at uh, at two o'clock. So um, 
me just do that now. <clears throat> right. Can everybody see the screen? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. 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 We've still got a few more people coming in, so um, still got another few minutes before we um, before we start. Um, this is um, for those just joining. Liz has put a link to the um, the annual review in the in the chat box, so we will be touching on that during the, the first presentation, but only picking out a few key highlights of it. So if, if you want to look at the annual review, which really sums up all, all the activity the branch has been up to over the last year, then uh, you can click on the link um, and have a look at it. Um, I should also say the uh, our photo competition is still running. Um, it's been open for a few days and some of, some of us have uh, voted in it already, but uh, it's still open for voting until uh, four o'clock this afternoon. We'll be announcing the results um, once at the end at the end of the day after the last speaker. Uh, but if you do want to vote and look at look at the photos and vote, then you can uh, if you click on the link in the chat box, then that will that will allow you to do that um, and hopefully still stay joined on to the meeting as well at the same time. Some great photos in there. Um, in interestingly, there are. Uh, uh, well over 100 entries in the UK butterfly competition this year, but not a single one in the overseas butterfly competition, which is the... Sorry! <laughs> I, suppose we could have, I suppose we could have predicted, really, but... Sorry! Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you're, you, you, you'd probably have swept the board, Brian, if you had entered, because that was, uh, no, nobody else got overseas. I guess so. I have some very good pictures of frosted dolphins. <laughs> Uh, well, you've, you've missed out. Next year, I will do it next year. Uh, well, it could, could be stiff competition next year, though. Actually, having 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 seen the way the uh, foreign travel is uh, is going, it, it, you you might you might have a clean sweep next year. I well. say no French butterflies. Not allowed to go to France, no. No, but I mean in the competition, the photo competition. No. Yeah, no well, that's exactly. Oh, it. that's You're right. From last year, I see. No, no, I see. No, no, I see. Rare, I had people last year. Oh yeah, well let me see if I can find a picture of one here and I'll just I'll just hold it up, you know. <laughs> Give me a moment. All right. What do I win? A pin? No, you're too late, too late to enter now. I'm okay, okay. <laughs> right. Wait to enter. Good. Okay, well, it's um, coming up to um, coming up to two o'clock, so I think we'll um, we'll probably start in just a moment. Good afternoon. I'm Malcolm Hull. I'm the chair of the, the Hearts of Middlesex branch of Butterfly Conservation. Welcome to our first ever online uh, annual general meeting and Members Day event. Um, it's good to see so many of you here. Um, what I'm going to do is just um, talk you through um, the agenda for the, this afternoon and then we'll launch into the, the formal part of the proceedings with, with our AGM. Um, what we've got uh, two great speakers uh, today, Bill Sterling and Zoe Randall. Um, and we'll introduce them in detail um, just in, in, in advance of their talks. Um, but what we're uh, what we're going to do first is to to look through look through the annual review, pick out a few key highlights, and go through the formal business of electing branch officers um, and approving the minutes. Um, I think there's um, a few things I just need to say first. Usually, usually I talk about fire escapes at this stage, which will be relieved to hear aren't, aren't on the agenda today. 
um, but there are a few other formalities associated with online meetings. Um, can you all um, please make sure that you are on mute and also turn your video camera off while we're um, we're having the the presentations, it's just so it doesn't distract the speaker and the audience. Um, we are recording this uh, this session, so if you don't want your image to appear on the recording, please keep your camera off at all times, or as Brian's just done, walk out the room. Um, if um, the, the recording will be available on the branch website probably in a day or two's time. Um, so if you miss part of it um, or, or you want to watch it again, then uh, you'll, you, you can you can look at it, look for it on the home page of the of the website. Um, there is a chat box facility, um, which I've referred to a few times. You should find a control to access it somewhere around the edge of your your screen. If you've got any comments or questions or things you just want to chip in um, during the whole course of the meeting, then please put it in there. When, when we're having um, questions, we'll try and take them at the end of each session uh, just to, to avoid um, damaging the flow. Um, also, there will be a few polls that I'll be running, um, in, in mostly in relation to the formal parts of the events. And I'll, I'll talk you through that and what needs to be done uh, as and when we get there. Um, so moving on to um, the, the formal section of the meeting, what, what we try to do is to simplify this as much as possible um, to, to, to remove the um, uh, too much formality, but also to, to focus on reporting on what the branch has actually been up to during the last year. Um, so it has been a very interesting year. Um, and once we've done that, we'll go through the um, the accounts and the, the branch branch officers election. So first of all, apologies for absence. Um, Liz Goodyear's our secretary has reported we've had apologies from uh, Chris Hilling and also from Paula Reed. Um, if if there are if anyone else is aware of any other apologies, then could you just put those in the chat box so Liz is aware. Um, we need to approve the, um, the minutes of our last annual general meeting. This was actually held uh, two years ago, as uh, unfortunately we couldn't, uh, <laughs> couldn't, couldn't, couldn't meet uh, in 2020. Um, it, it's been um, pre-proposed and seconded by Ian uh, and Clifford. Um, and what, in a moment, I'll launch the vote. Um, we're just asking you to vote if you do approve the, the minutes or disapprove them. The minutes were posted on the branch website and a link sent to all the members so you can read them if you want to but we in case you haven't bothered to read them um, there is an option to uh, to abstain if you want to so let me let me see if I can launch that poll um, now and it should come up on your screens any second if you can see the uh, the, bo the the different boxes I can see people are voting now so um, Excellent. Looks like you've all got the hang of it. Okay, well, in that, um, and pleased to say that um, those are approved. Thank you very much. So, next on to Branch review of 2020. Um, as I mentioned, the, 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 the branch review has been uh, published on the on, on the branch website. There's there's ten reports from officers altogether, and it's it's actually a really interesting account of, of everything that's been going on during the year. Well worth the read if you haven't haven't looked at it so far. Um, but I won't go through all the details of it. We're just going to pick out a few highlights and perhaps look ahead a bit more than we did um, at that time. Um, 2020 really was the year when everything changed. Um, the, the, the lockdown, the virus, everything was very different. Um, the, the worst aspect, we had quite a few branch members and friends um, who sadly passed away during the year. I've mentioned um, 
several in my report. And I'd, I'd just like to pick out John Hollingdale and Brian Salford, who both found the members of the, the, the branch committee, who both contributed enormously to our work um, in their different ways. And I'm very sad to, to, to see their loss. And I know it was a, a year when many people did lose um, friends and relatives. So I think it's important to recognise that. It says um, Windows not responding and my internet connection is unstable. Um, I'm getting a bit of interference, so I'm just going to mute everybody. Hopefully you can still hear me, but I can't hear you. Um, so, yeah, I think the the next thing I want to mention was our, um, all, all, our, all our meetings were cancelled and, and the majority of our butterfly walks um, and moth events, which was, again was very sad. Though I was, I was pleased we did manage to, to go ahead with a few butterfly walks in, in fairly restricted numbers. Um, and also managed to video several of the events and, and make videos available to members so that you actually got quite a good close up view of the butterflies you would have seen if you had been able to go out in the field with us. Um, we are um, optimistically looking forward to organising a programme of walks for the, for the, for the year ahead, um, hopefully starting towards the end of May. Uh, and there will be more information coming out on that in the newsletter during May. I guess another big aspect of the year was the, the, the sea change in our online communications. Um, we've managed to get a lot more hits on the branch website, um, a lot, lot more people looking at the Twitter and Facebook accounts. So we're really communicating an awful lot more better than we have um, with members for some time. Um, we've also started sending out our newsletters electronically, uh, thanks to the new head office um, mailing system, we can now email all branch members, which has been invaluable during the, 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 the process of organising these talks. Um, but we've also had been sending out the newsletters electronically and had some very good feedback from that. So I think what, what we've decided to do going forward is to, to focus on having um, newsletters sent out by email as the default method of communication. There will still be an option for you to, to receive a hard copy if that's your preference. And certainly for the time being, we're still planning to, to send the, the annual branch uh, report um, on all the butterfly sightings seen in the two counties um, in hard copy. But we will be um, both at branch level and, and head office level refreshing uh, people's desires of the different way they'd like to be communicated with in future and you should be getting communications about that during the, during the next few months certainly during the course of the year um, so please look at those carefully to make sure that we are communicating with you in the right way the winter events program was another real success for our, for our online events um, we, we've organised five different talks on different aspects of butterflies and moths, and they've all been very well attended. Well, I think we've had between 50 and 65 people for each talk. Um, we've got recordings of four of the talks um, on the homepage of the branch website, which you can catch up with um, if you miss them, and, and they're all well worth looking at. The, the, the one talk where the recording went wrong was uh, was was fortunately was the one one of the talks I, I was doing so um, you, you didn't 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 miss very much by not seeing that one again. But all the other ones are excellent. Um, and in fact, well, I was looking at the statistics of how many people have have watched them um, since the recordings have been up, and we've actually for most of them we've had significantly more people watch them afterwards than actually attended on the on the on the evening. So we've reached between 100 and 150 people for each talk, which is fantastic. And just to give a plug to uh, the French Connection, uh, Roger's talk on the butterflies of France, which uh, will be on at eight o'clock this Wednesday. Um, Roger spends half his time in France, as those you know him are aware, um, except this year. So really, really knowledgeable and uh, it should prove really fun. We're doing that talk jointly with the European Butterflies Group as well. I wanted to mention the some of the other ways we, we communicate. The, the video page on the branch website is, uh, contains quite a lot of uh, links to quite a lot of videos that we've, we've shot during the year. Um, and Peter Clark, who manages the website for us, uh, has also put in a selection of other videos from different locations that are, are all really interesting to watch. So 
if you go on the video page of the branch website, that there is a lot of interesting information on there now. Um, although it, on, on the website itself, it's all links and it links you through to other sites. Um, and for that reason, we've recently taken the decision to open our own branch YouTube channel. Um, so the Harps of Middlesex Butterfly Conservation YouTube channel went live yesterday, um, which at the time I took this photograph had two subscribers, which was myself and Andrew Wood. Uh, but if anyone else would like to subscribe to it, then you will get not notified as and when new videos um, of local butterflies and moths are, are added, and you'll be able to watch and enjoy those. Um, we do want to, to increase the content on there. So if you've got um, uh, any videos that you would like to share with other branch members, then do get in touch with either Andrew or Peter Clark or myself, um, and we'll make sure they get posted up there. But 2020 wasn't, it wasn't the, the only change was, um, sorry. Yeah, but the move online wasn't the only thing that changed in 2020. Um, it was the it was a, a major year of change when there was a lot of um, a lot of other things changed as well. I think lockdown gave people more time to think, more time to get closer to nature, and COVID brought home to people how fragile life on our planet really is. The biodiversity crisis and the decline in insect populations were highlighted. Um, not least by our president, David Attenborough. People are more worried now, worried more than ever, and they want to do something about it. Of course, these concerns aren't new. They're very similar to those which led to the foundation of butterfly conservation 50 years ago. And making a noise about the biodiversity crisis is very important. But I also want to highlight a few practical examples of how we're tackling the crisis on the ground from a practical perspective. So what are we doing about it? Well, first of all, um, if you're going to tackle a crisis in biodiversity, the, the first thing you need to do is to have great information. Um, we've always been really strong in this branch about recording effort, and we have compiled an annual report. I think this is now the 26th um, in a row each year, uh, recording how many butterflies have been seen in, in Hearts and Middlesex. This year we had 62,000 butterfly records, which is more than we've ever had before. And they came from well over 3,000 different individual um, recorders. So it's a fantastic effort by all the recorders and by Andrew Wood, who puts all the information together. But that gives us a really strong base on which to, to start advising people about habitats and butterflies in, in our area. Second thing we do is habitat management. Um, this is a picture of some cuddly looking sheep introduced onto our, our reserve at Millhopper's Pasture near Tring. We, we, we've had been managing this for several years and really got to know a lot about the ups and downs of managing a site for wildlife. But I'm delighted to say that this year with our, our four reserve wardens um, all working closely together, we've managed to get conservation grazing reintroduced onto the site. And that's one of the very best ways you can possibly manage a grassland where you're trying to attract butterflies. Habitat creation is another area that we focus on. Um, this is a picture of the, the chalk bank in Greenwood Park, um, which we constructed with the help of National Lottery funding. That's been, that's been a good success and the vegetation is now becoming well established thanks to the uh, recent construction of a rabbit fence around the edge. But hopefully that will soon prove to be great habitat for small blues um, and other local butterflies. But perhaps the thing we do best is when we bring all our skills together. Um, this picture of the brown hair streak is, is one I took in, in West London, a butterfly that died out in our area. Um, 20 years ago, but has now successfully managed to make a comeback under its own steam. And we've been really helping and supporting it along the way. Uh, first of all, um, an, a, an amazing recording effort, um, which has carefully mapped the locations it's the bus flyer and its eggs have been seen in. So we know exactly where 
a habitat needs to be managed to be suitable. Secondly, identifying what habitat management is appropriate for the species. And then thirdly, engaging with the landowners and local authorities in order to make sure that they do understand that they have a rare butterfly in their area and how to manage the sites for it. And I think we're starting to get some real successes with our um, agreements with the, the landowners at Ickenham, which is the main site, and also seeing how it's spread around the around North and West Middlesex, now within a, a mile of Hertfordshire border. So we're hoping that next year we'll be able to report it in Hertfordshire as well. I want to say just a little bit about big city butterflies. This is a project you've heard me speaking of quite a lot over the last five years, but um, it's been on a fairly slow burn. And frankly, um, this last year has been pretty frustrating uh, as we haven't really managed to make any progress with it at all in, on the ground. Although we have now got all the funding um, for the first phases in place, um, it, job, job, jobs, um, job descriptions have been out for the two project officers that we're going to employ and interviews are going to be taking place during the course of the next week. So hopefully by the time we get to May, we will have, we'll have two full-time officers in post, one focusing on education and one on conservation, and the project will run for four years. It's, it's really it's focusing on on butterflies of, of, of inner, inner London and, and really trying to draw more people into to butterfly conservation and work in an area where we you know frankly struggled in the past to get much traction um, but there'll be lots more information on that coming along I think if you want to keep closely in touch with the project then um, sign up for the big city butterflies newsletter I think there'll be a link being posted in the chat box shortly if it's not there already and uh, what we'll do is try and sorry um what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit more about this in the uh, in the interval um okay so we're now getting to stage where um just looking at the accounts for the last year um I can see our treasurer is trying to ring me on the other line, so I take it he's not joining on the meeting, so I hope you haven't got any thoughtful questions for him. Um, we don't have to approve the accounts with a vote this year, um, thankfully, um, but I think in summary it's been a very um, it's been a very good year for the branch financially because we our, our income um, from from subscriptions has been largely unaffected. Uh, we did quite well from donations this year. Um, but we found it really, really difficult to, to spend money. Um, the accounts you're looking at are for the year up to March last year, when we'd already started to, to find trouble spending money. And uh, frankly, in this year, we've, we've, we've spent even less. So we did, um, during the course of the year, decide to make a donation of uh, £5,000, which is a considerable sum in our terms, to, to head office, um, as head office uh, have had real financial problems as a result of... Um, grant funding being turned off during the, the COVID period. Um, but what we're, what we're doing now is, um, is, is put setting a budget for the year ahead uh, and hopefully that will, will get back more into even, even territory. But as things stand, we're, we're in a very good financial position at the start of um, this financial year, which starts in April. So that's the end of the formal bit. Um, about the branch review. We just now need to, to deal with election of branch officers. Um, the, the, the officers uh, form a committee and run the branch. Um, they're elected each year um, by, by the members at this meeting. Um, every year, a third of the, the committee has to stand down. Um, and if they want to, can apply for re-election. Um, as we didn't have um, a vote last year, we've got uh, four people from last year that are, all, all want to apply for re-election and another four from this year. So that's eight. In addition, we've uh, co-opted uh, Clifford Mullet as treasurer uh, and Alex Lewis to do publicity during the course of the year. Um, and um, now we're both uh, then being co-opted to the kids committee. They're now also um, looking to stand for election. So that's 10 people all together that we want to elect. Um, we do have vacancies on the committee, so if there are any other members that would like to, to consider joining the committee at any stage, then I'm very happy to have a chat about that and talk a bit more about what's involved. Um, members are welcome to attend committee meetings at any time. Um, 
and as these are currently being held on Zoom, it's quite easy to attend them. So if, if any of you would like to attend the committee meeting just to see what goes on, and what we talk about and how it works, then you're very welcome and do get in touch with Liz Goodyear about that and she'll make sure that you get an invitation to the next one. So what I'm going to do now is to run another poll. Um, rather than spend a lot of time over it, I've decided to put everybody to a vote at the same time. Um, so you've got the option of voting for them um, or against them or abstaining. Um, and if any, as I, if anyone else does want to come on to uh, to the committee, then uh, you're you're very welcome to to get in touch, and we'll we, we can talk about it. But I'll launch the poll now and um, give you a chance to have a vote. Now I can see people are voting, which is um, is good news because it's the first indication I've had for about uh, the last 15 minutes that anyone's still there. So it looks like everyone's voted now. So I'm going to end the polling and share the results, which look fairly conclusive. Thank you. Right, so that really brings us to, to the end of the uh, annual general meeting section. Thank you to everybody who's taken part in branch activities during the year, um, particularly um, the committee. Uh, Liz Goodyear for organising today's event. Um, thank you to all the all the members and and all the supporters um, who've contributed Busfly Records, um, and thanks also to all the partner organisations that we've worked with um, at different sites through the year. So, if anybody's got any um, questions or comments, then uh, please do um, put them in the chat box, and we'll we'll have a look at those in just a moment. Um, do feel free to contact me or any other member of the committee if you've got any questions or comments or suggestions or anything else you'd like to talk about at any time. Um, I just wanted to mention um, donations. Usually um, when you arrive in the hall, there's a little bucket um, just on the right as you walk in, which has donations on it, which people have been um, very generous at putting money in over the years. Um, Having told you what I have about branch, branch finances this year, we're, we're not having an online bucket um, for the branch, um, but we do, um, we, we have, I would like um, people to, if they are able to, to consider giving a donation to the Bus by Conservation Head Office. Um, funding is still very tight uh, for Head Office and it, they've been doing everything they can to try and um, keep going as much activities as possible, but suffered a lot due to um, grants being um, stopped and all sorts of other problems they've experienced due, during the COVID period. So if you can, please um, please go online and donate at head office. And I will be um, putting that link in the chat box shortly. Okay, so now it comes to questions. Um, okay, Malcolm, I have one question from Maggie Cartmel. Um, she wanted, she asked the, the Plant Life Charity is um, supporting No Mo May. Is it Butterfly Conservation to uh, consider that as well? Um, yeah, I think we've, we've worked very closely with Plant Life in the last year or two, particularly on the, um, the, 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 the publication that they put out about not mowing um, grass verges. Um, which has been aimed particularly at local authorities. So yes, I think generally we would support um, no mo may. I think um, in, on some sites we do um, where we work with, with there there is um, cutting or grazing that takes place early in the season to remove the first flush of um, first flush of grass before the, the butterfly season gets going. So we're not totally opposed to. Um, removing any grass um, in the early stages of the season, but um, certainly would, would want to encourage um, 
wildflowers on on on, on roadsides as much as possible. So I'm sure no mo may will be high on our agenda as well. I have been posting all the links. The only thing is, as I did suspect if you had to, if you were late arriving you can't view the old chat so I keep I do keep posting it so apologies to everyone that I keep posting these links but it's so that everyone that's joining can still see them yeah okay well we've um yeah if um in similar vein if if you'd like to if you'd like to take part in the photo competition there's still a chance of uh, of doing that up until four o'clock and we'll have the results um, available after the end of the, the second talk. Right, Jean has said she couldn't, um, right, I couldn't hear what you said about the branch uh, finances, would you mind repeating it? And Phil Sterling is just saying he's going to be discussing uh, NOMO May in his talk, so I think he'll be covered again perfectly but um jean would like to hear a bit more about the finances please right well i, I can i can only hope that bill is supporting no mo may otherwise i'll be in trouble won't i um <laughs> but yeah jean sorry about that um yeah i think as far as the finances are concerned um we, we're basically at local level we're in very good shape um the consequence of um consequence of, of lockdown has been that um you know, most of the things we spend money on usually, i.e. physical activities, haven't happened. So we've spent relatively little money compared to normal or normal activities. We have spent a little bit more on uh, things like Zoom subscriptions, um, but most of the, the surplus that we had last year was, was donated to head office. Um, the impact on their finances has been very different to that at, uh, at branch level. So. Um, we, we felt it was appropriate to um, to, to give them um, the vast amount uh, vast amount of our, our unspent funds for last year. Um, I don't know if Clifford's on the line now. Whether you've got anything to add to that, Clif Clifford is our new treasurer, recently elected. Congratulations, Clifford. Maybe not. Clifford has joined. He may just be still working out the technical side of life. <laughs> yes, I think we're all doing that a bit still. I can see that Clifford is still on mute. Ah. We've all been there. Does, does that answer your question, Jean, or was there, is there anything else that you wanted to know? Okay, I'm, I'm off. Hi, Clifford. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't take your call earlier. I was in the middle of talking. Yeah, I've, I've, I've had, um, it didn't work on my iPad, so I had to suddenly get onto my computer, and now I'm back on the iPad. Oh, so, well done. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, you're quite right in what you said. Our, our, um, our subscriptions have stayed um, pretty stable. Thank you every, very much for, to everybody for sticking with us and um, keeping our income going. And of course, our, um, our expenditure has gone down. Um, we're, we're budgeting for a bit more expenditure, but in view of our reduced income, um, sorry, reduced expenditure, we had a quite a good surplus and we've transferred £5,000 back to head office who are struggling, I understand. Um, we're not, and uh, our budgeting for, for, for next year, um, are we looking at 2021 or are we looking at 21-22? I keep this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think for next year, we're, we're, we're planning a fairly even budget, aren't we? But um, we don't really yet know how much physical activities are going to take place and how many online ones so it's uh, it, we're, well, we're, budgeting, uh, we're, we're budgeting anyway for, for roughly a break-even position yeah. um, and that, rem re that means that we would remain with about um, six thousand pounds in the bank um, right. at the end of this current year cool okay thanks very much were there any other questions at all Liz Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, I know. I thought I'd shake my head instead and you'd see that. Um, no, we have, there aren't any more questions. I've just put a link to the photo competition again so people can go and visit that 
in this short break. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, that's perfect timing because we're uh, at 2.30. We're due for a short break and now it's 2.31. So fantastic. And Phil is here. So we've got our next speaker. Um, I think Zoe's still to arrive, but she was talking this morning at the National Recorders meeting. So she's zooming out. She'll be completely zoomed out by the end of the day. Okay, so um, what we thought we'd do um, now, we'll, we'll give you a chance to um, stretch your legs and get a cup of tea if you'd like to. Um, we're very conscious not to induce Zoom fatigue in any, in any members, but um, uh, we've got, um, I think, Paul Busby's on the line, um, and we'll, um, we'll be talking a little bit about Big City Butterflies and the, the project that's coming up in London. Um, in a moment or two, I'll show you um, a slideshow that uh, Kate Merry, the, the staff officer that's running it at present, has put together, um, which will give you a little bit more idea of the um, about the event. Um, but then Paul, Paul will say something and, and be here to answer any questions specifically on, on that. Um, we'll then start again with the, uh, the, the, the more formal part of it at um, 2.45. Okay. Hi, Corinne. Can hear you. Hi, Brian. <clears throat> Hi, Peter. Oops, this is off. Oh, he's got a video showing now. Sorry. Hopefully, you're starting to see the slides coming through. But, um... There are some pictures a bit later on. <laughs> now you have one more book. I do indeed. <laughs> you still got snow? No snow, thank goodness. <laughs> no, I have two thousand crocuses in my yard now. Not, not, nothing that's attracting butterflies. But.
So, Paul, do you want to talk us through a bit more where we've got to with uh, Big City Butterflies? And um... Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's quite nice to have a, a quiet presentation where you can just relax and uh, chill out. So I think it's a, a nice opportunity to see some of the, the great places in London and some of the butterflies we have. Um, so as Malcolm said, big, um, my name's Paul Busby. I'm the Middlesex contact for the, the branch. Uh, and I've been working with Malcolm and uh, the Surrey branch and Essex and Kent branches to work on this project. So um, we finally have uh, the approval. It's a four year project, which is fantastic. And we'll be working um, across inner London, We're currently in the recruitment phase for two project officers. Um, and we actually cover um, about 17 London boroughs. So it's, a, it's quite a large area that we're, we're current, covering. So that's all the way from uh, Brent, all the way to uh, Tower Hamlets in Middlesex, you know, taking into account Camden, Hackney, um, Hammersmith and Fulham, Westminster, all of those type of boroughs. And then over to Essex and uh, Kent, we have uh, Greenwich and Lewisham, and in Surrey, south of the river, Lambeth, Southwark, and uh, Wandsworth. So within those areas, there's lots to do, and it will keep the project officers um, very, um, very busy with, with the work they've got to do. Um, so there are three strands to the project. So uh, one of them is the uh, engagement, and that's everything from um, sharing our love of butterflies and moths with school children, community groups, friends groups, um, anybody that uh, wishes to you know, expand the knowledge or even share the knowledge, and uh, which will be a fantastic thing. Uh, a second part is uh, recording and monitoring. And um, I think the more records we have, the, the better we'll understand the, um, the butterflies in London. And I think what sometimes people don't realize that we now have um, in that project area, uh, 31 species of butterfly, which is um, quite fantastic for a, an urban area, isn't it? So, and um, since the 1980s, we've lost one species, which is the wall, but we, you know, there's probably about another nine species which have increased uh, their expansion across the London area through, you know, various um, reasons. So, you now get silver wash fertilities in the middle of London at Tower Hamlets. You, um, Marble whites can be seen all across London and ringlets. So um, there is a lot to learn and um, know about London. And the third strand of the project is really about um, habitat management. So it's working with uh, maybe schools and um, uh, landowners, councils, uh, friends groups, who, you know, to improve the habitats that we have. So there's, there's a lot there. Um, people can get involved in any um, way they'd like to. All the events are, are free. It's a national uh, Heri uh, heritage lottery funded project. So all the events will be free. Um, and probably if you're interested in uh, learning more details is you can sign up for the newsletter, which uh, Liz has sent the link around. More than happy to take any questions um, on the subject. And uh, um, I think it's gonna be a fantastic project and really um, to, learn more about in London will be excellent you know so um, that's very briefly in a nutshell a bit about the project I don't know if anyone has any particular questions at all um, it may of the start and launch will, has probably been delayed a little bit with Covid but um, I think recruitment's going well and um, hopefully uh, late spring you know we should expect to launch the project and um, it'll be lovely if people want to uh, get involved with the project either as a visitor to London or whether you work in London or you reside in London. Um, there'll be lots of activities to learn about lots of new sites in London. I think, you know, London is a place where you can never actually know all the little nature reserves that there are. And, uh, you know, I think it's a good opportunity to, um, you know, stretch, stretch your legs and um, learn some more. I don't know if anybody's got any particular questions or um, um, about the project. It's, I don't know if we have any on the chat at all. Um, no, nothing's come up on chat, um, Paul. Um, I don't know whether Simon Savile's listening and 
can add anything as well, because as a representative from Surrey. I am listening. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Simon. Hi there. Now, I think um, Paul's described it well. Um, Kate is actually giving a talk, Kate Mary, as one of the series of the Surrey branch talks on Wednesday next. And there's still some places available for that if you want to sign up. It's free um, on Zoom, obviously. Um, uh, and um, recruitment is underway. The, the interviews are on Tuesday and Wednesday, and Phil is on the interview panel for at least some of them. So he can maybe give you a comment as well about it because I don't know if you're online. Um, yes, thank you very much. Uh, Simon, I can do that. And uh, nice to meet you virtually, um, Paul, as well. Uh, I'll just start my video so you can actually see me. Hurrah. Um, yes, uh, I mean, a lot of people have applied for both jobs. So that's for the conservation officer and the engagement officer. And so we've got a pretty packed program for Tuesday and Wednesday for interviewing. I imagine we will have made our decisions by the end of the week, if not certainly by the early the following week and um, you know appointments take a while if people are moving jobs it's usually a month or so at least um, so I would expect yes certainly by early May we will be uh, looking to uh, get the officers in in post and get them starting work um, from my project you'll be hearing about my project obviously in a few minutes um, building sites for butterflies I've been working in London for the last two and a bit years and have made I think some reasonable progress with uh, a number of um, of uh, people who are really interested in um, getting getting more butterflies and moths into the uh, into the city, and uh, we've um, under the brilliant butterflies project, which I know is not something so much for Hearts and Middlesex, but very much so for for Simon and crew in the sort of South London area, where we've been concentrating on um, uh, London boroughs of Croydon. In Bromley, um, we've been creating butterfly banks there, and that has gone down a storm. It's done extremely well, despite all the difficulties of working in lockdown. And we've had tremendous support online. We've been out there creating habitats within the uh, within the the boroughs, and and it's all gone very well. It's a very short project, only two years, so it ends in September. But um, but we're really surprised, I think, by the take up. And so I think this bodes extremely well for big city butterflies is that certainly there's a there's a ground plan of how we've approached in partnership with the London Wildlife Trust and with the Natural History Museum. The, um, the, the, the how do you create a sustainable habitats for butterflies and moths within an existing built up area? So we know we know pretty much what we would like to do. And it's it's um, big city butterflies is, is different. It's bigger, it's broader. Um, but it will be attempting to do some fairly similar sorts of activities with people and to create habitats in urban areas. So, I mean, it's a fantastic, fantastic opportunity. And I will I will be playing my part in helping to to advise the officers on, on how they can create the create a big wow in London. So I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, thanks, Phil. Um, I'm afraid I have to stop you talking there because we've yeah. got to uh, make way for our next speaker, um, which um, is you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> so, um, welcome to uh, Dr. Phil Sterling. Phil is uh, a doctor of philosophy um, who spends much of his time in Dorset. He's passionate about butterflies and moths. Uh, he works for Butterfly Conservation as a program manager for the Building Sites for Butterflies program. Um, he's joint author of uh, various books, including recent field guides on cat caterpillars and micro moths. Um, Phil, Phil has helped us uh, a good deal when we were working on the Greenwood Park project, which, uh, which I mentioned earlier, which we're very grateful for. Um, and um, we're very much looking forward to hearing what he has to say. So back to you, Phil. Oh, thank you very much. That's great. Yes, perhaps I shouldn't have spoken so much earlier, but there we go. Anyway, you're going to hear a bit from me now for the next... I guess 40 minutes perhaps, and then we'll have um, time for questions or if people need a break, they can have that. But um, I'm fully aware people could get Zoomed out this afternoon. So um, feel free to pop questions in the chat as you go along. And, uh, you know, because there's always plenty of 
plenty of things to say. Um, my my history is that um, as well as being a uh, an academic ecologist, I've spent probably 30 plus years working either in industry or in local government as um, an ecological advisor. And it was particularly in my time working at Dorset County Council for nigh on 25 years that I, I don't know, I mean, there are lots of opportunities to create habitats, but I think of the, the one thing that really got up my goat was the oh, pathetic management of green spaces that were within uh, urban areas that just didn't seem to reflect the, 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 the obvious trends that were happening in our wildlife in this country. And, and just to see the constant, constant mowing of grass just really did it for me. And I think I just got increasingly frustrated by that. And then, oh, happen chance, four years before I left the County Council, I was promoted and put in charge of road verge management within the County Council. So that gave me just about a million pound budget and staff and contracts. And for the first time ever, you put an ecologist in charge of an enormous area of green space management. Whoopee. And uh, so part of what I'm going to describe to you this afternoon is the changes that have happened since that time, because I've now left the County Council. I'm now at Butterfly Conservation, loving it there um, because I'm out promoting the changes that I uh, was able to effect within the County Council in Dorset, and I'm promoting that nationally now. And um, here's the sort of information that I'm going to be talking to you this afternoon, you know, putting into practice the very, very simple, well, they are at least in theory, simple uh, mechanisms to be able to improve our urban habitats for wildlife. And you can immediately see, therefore, the crossover with big city butterflies. So here we go. My talk, I'm about to share my screen and it is, let's just see that we can see that. If somebody could, I can't now see anybody. So I will need somebody just to unmute and say, I can now see the screen. I can see the screen. I can see the screen. Thank you very much indeed. Great. So making the best of the built environment for butterflies and moths. Now, you know, Leading question this, which would people prefer? The following this view here in the screen or this view? It's pretty obvious, isn't it really? These are both managed pieces of green space. Uh, in the first example, it is gang mown regularly every year. And with the decreases in, uh, in budgets with local authorities, then gang mowing is a little less often. And so you end up with these massive clods of rotting, gray, brown grass all over the place. It effectively makes the green spaces pretty unusable for the period, and it contributes absolutely nothing to wildlife conservation. In this picture you're seeing here is, this was very much a gang mown piece of uh, uh, green space within uh, urban Weymouth, and we transformed it. It wasn't very hard, and I will tell you how we did it. But what is really important is that we understand these days that our green spaces are not just about neat mown grass. We actually want a whole lot more from them. So uh, we expect our green spaces to help out with flooding, with biodiversity, with, with climate change, with air quality, but we also expect them to create a sense of place. And, and that's very much from a wildlife and a wildflower point of view about the local species that live in that area. And another frustration of mine is that every time you turn up to a supermarket, it's the same flipping trees and shrubs that are planted all over the country. And that frustrates me is that there's nothing local about them. Indeed, these tend to be species that aren't even native. So there's not a hope of a white letter hair streak being able to, to, to thrive in a, in a supermarket car park because nobody's planted any disease resistant elm. Now I know some people will already have started that, but that's the mission I'm on, is to get people to see some simple changes that they can make to the, the, the design and the management of green spaces to start building those ecosystem services that green spaces can provide, some of which are on this slide. Now, here's how we normally create 
our green spaces, so our grasslands, is that whenever they're designed, traditionally, I don't know, for the last 40, 50 years, whatever the material is that was beneath the, the, the grass and the rest of it, it has a good layer of topsoil put on it. We've become obsessed with this stuff and it's time to unleash ourselves from topsoil. And we tended to put on 150 mil of topsoil onto a subsoil or a mineral base, and then we sow it with amenity grass. And part of the reason for doing that is because the day the road opens, the school opens, the community park opens, the mayor or whoever it is, a dignitary comes along to cut the ribbon and everything's looking neat and tidy and green and pleasant. And that's great, but somebody has to look after it forever and a day afterwards. And you can see in the right hand picture here in the center, just the amount of mowing that we do in this country. I estimated um, uh, the amount of green space management, mowing that goes on th across the UK to be somewhere in the region of half a billion pounds that we're spending on just mowing grass every year. Now, I don't know about you, but I think we could probably do something more useful with that money. And why I'm obsessed about topsoil is because soil fertility is actually a really powerful driver of grass growth. So if you look at the picture on the left and you look at the one on the right and compare them, this is a same piece of road verge, not far from me down in Weymouth, that was designed by my then engineering colleagues and uh, which had its normal specification of 150 mil of topsoil. And on the left, that's what they put down. And on the right, they'd kind of run out and, and didn't order any in, and so left it as subsoil spread the same. Um, uh, so that subsoil, that, that's, that's no topsoil at all, and just spread the same amenity grass seed and then left it. Now on the left, this is mid-April, um, uh, uh, that grass now needs management, and that has to be mown in order to maintain the safety of the highway. So its function as green space means that it has to be cut. And on the right, on the subsoil, this low fertility material, it doesn't need cutting at all. This, this, these photos taken on the same day. And what you also notice, flip back to the left, two dandelions and a daisy that you can see probably. And on the right, loads of daisies and some dandelions and celandines. And if you got down on your hands and knees, you'd see a whole load of other common wildflower species in the turf. And that tells you pretty much everything you need to know about what drives biodiversity in amenity grassland, is that where you've got low fertility, you get lots of fine grasses and herbs, and there are plenty of gaps for germination. Where you've got thick topsoil, you get coarse grasses, you get very few gaps for germination, and those coarse grasses dominate and smother the rest of the vegetation. If only we could understand that in our everyday lives. And part of my building sites for butterflies program advice is to teach people how to do it. So that's the great thing about this biodiversity is that our grasslands, the high biod if we want high biodiversity grasslands, we want low fertility because in nature, our best grasslands for wildflowers, bees, butterflies, whatever it is, they develop on the poorest soil. So if you, you know, we cherish our chalk and limestone grasslands, we cherish our sand dunes and, uh, and some of our neutral grasslands, or in fact, over in Hertfordshire and not that far from, from uh, Breck Sands with that amazing complexity of, of thin kind of calcareous and loamy soils. Wonderful, wonderful biodiversity out there, all based on low nutrient soils. And that's um, because our wildflowers are adapted to, to tolerate very low levels of nutrients. And in doing so, they, they scavenge for what they can. And that means lots of species can survive with each other. So that's the system. If we want to build biodiversity into our urban environments in our grasslands, that's what we've got to do. Lower the fertility. So stop putting topsoil on there. My biggest experiment with not putting topsoil on anything was back in 2009 to 2011, when I was as part of the project team on the construction of the Weymouth Relief Road, which was built 
um, just prior to the London Olympics and uh, where Weymouth um, held the sailing events, which you, you may or may not remember. And um, those road verges, um, I was able to specify a, a fraction of the amount of topsoil on quite a lot of them and no topsoil whatsoever on quite a lot of the rest of the verges. So across seven hectares, they either had a thin scattering of soil or subsoil only. So that was clays or limestones or, or sands, whatever it was, I said, do not put any topsoil anywhere near it. Not only that, I then included a seed mix, you know, basic chalk grassland seed mix. Now, whether that was clays, neutral clays or, or, or alkaline chalk, I didn't really mind. Just put the wildflowers on there and let nature take its course. But what I did do is to include one pioneer species in there. And for those keenies amongst you who will have already seen what that pioneer species is, it's kidney vetch, of course. And why are we all interested in kidney vetch? I don't need to talk to you about that. Kidney vetch being the sole food plant for the small blue. And as a pioneer species, it loves germinating and flourishing and thriving on bare ground. And it looks absolutely spectacular. So I think we ought to be putting kidney vetch into virtually every seed mix that, that is sown all across the country, to be honest, because small blue is in a bit of a state. Um, although I'm doing my bit to try and turn it round. Um, and, and it should be a common and widespread species across the country. But it isn't because we are doing our damnedest either in an agricultural environment or in an urban environment to try and stop uh, kidney vetch from spreading as a plant. So we need to reverse that. And that's partly what I'm trying to do now. Just in terms of where are we now with small blue on the Weymouth Relief Road across those seven hectares? Well, actually not. I think the, these figures in front of you just cover about the counts across two hectares of, of, uh, of the slopes of the verges. So the, the butterfly was first recorded back in 2012. So literally six months after the road opened and probably 18 months after the first seed was sown. So a pioneer plant comes into flower very quickly. And even though small blue, the nearest colony we're aware of was about four miles away, it only took this wee critter 18 months to get there. So I th some of us think of small blue as perhaps a rather delicate butterfly, doesn't really fly very far. Mm, I kind of think that it's perfectly capable of getting around the environment. So if we can produce habitats, with lots of kidney vetch on them, we're almost certain to produce habitat for small blue. Look at the numbers, they're doing very well. Um, 2019 was an exceptional year across much of Southern England. I don't know about the Hertfordshire area for small blue, but uh, it was certainly very good in, in, in most of Southern England, certainly in Surrey and on all the way through Hampshire and into Dorset. So, you know, those numbers have been steadily growing over the years. Quite when, when they will plateau, we don't know, but it's amazing to go out there. And there are, hun I mean, you can see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of small blue on these verges. It's an amazing sight, particularly to go out in late afternoon or early evening when the butterflies are roosting on some of the taller grasses. There are dozens jostling for position on the grasses. It's, it's almost tear jerking to see the numbers of small blue that are coming in. And I hope that gives you all good heart for what's going on in Greenwood Park. Um, uh, nice to hear the little update from Malcolm earlier that uh, now at least you've got the rabbit fence around there, um, that the plants are doing rather better. And, and, you know, I would imagine given firstly, you'll be allowed out this spring to go and have a look, that, that it's, it's, I would have thought it was very likely that you, if you haven't already, that you will be seeing small blue on there this year. And that will probably be the start of, of, of their survival there for, oh, I don't know, with pretty minimal interference for the next 15 or 20 years. I mean, remarkable and, and well done you for getting that done and, and well done to all the volunteers who've worked so hard to create that habitat. Um, and I look forward to coming up and seeing it this spring too. So back to the Weymouth Relief Road, um, lots of blues on there. Um, I see six species of blue. We've already had um, small blue and then there are four more on this slide uh, and the majority in flower in this picture is obviously horseshoe vetch 
uh, Adonis Blue moved in very quickly um, in 2013, and numbers have been fluctuating, but were exceptionally high last year. Chalk Hill Blue, um, it's not a, it's not doing well in Dorset as a butterfly. Uh, numbers have collapsed dramatically, except on Portland, which you can just see in the far distance in this shot, and that's 11 miles away. But um, but Chalk Hill Blue did arrive in 2018 and uh, has been seen each year in very low numbers and uh, was seen in 2019 on Transect. Um, and we're hopeful that the numbers will start to build. But if it does build, then that's a very interesting point, is that despite the collapse in Chalk Hill Blue numbers across most of the inland sites in Dorset, virtually all of the inland sites in Dorset, if we can see that the butterfly can uh, colonize and increase on created sites, then that should give us hope that actually what we need to be doing is to creating many more habitats with uh, on chalk with horseshoe vetch for this species. But um, it's very pleasing to see so many uh, butterflies around on this site. Now, um, here's, a, here's a bit that's not on chalk. This is on uh, the, the, the series known as the Portland Sand series, which is a kind of muddy clays, um, sort of very fine silty clays. They are rather calcareous. Um, but uh, this was a view last summer and an absolute stunning picture of pyramidal orchid. Um, and the year before it was a mix of pyramidal orchids and bee orchids. So this is, this, it's, it's not just the butterflies, but you can create some stunning, stunning environments for wildlife if you just stop putting stop topsoil on something. And also in this picture, the last person to stand on that road verge other than me photographing it, was me sowing the seed. Nobody's done anything to that verge since. It's not had one single mower anywhere near it. It doesn't need it. It still performs its main function, which is to be open ground in the highway to improve visibility and, and it's uh, you know, maintaining the stability of the ground and it's costing the authority nothing to do it. And that is a really important message, is that actually when you increase the biodiversity by lowering the fertility, you reduce the maintenance burden, and that's very important. But back to the wildlife. 141 species of plant when we last counted in 2019 across the seven hectares, and we are leveling off at 30 species of butterfly that have been recorded um, on, the, uh, on the slopes. Um, in the last 10 years. And, and as you will know, there are 59, or maybe now 60 species of breeding butterfly in Britain. That's nigh on half the species of breeding butterfly in Britain have been found in the last 10 years on the Weymouth Relief Road. I think that should all give us great hope that biodiversity is, you know, is not a lost cause. We have it in our gift to be able to do each in their own ability to be able to create habitats for butterflies, whether that's in a garden, in a park, as part of a major scheme, but providing we get the basic specifications right, nature will follow on. And that's my motto really, is if, if you build it, they will come. And so here's the overall numbers of butterflies uh, since 2012, which is when uh, uh, the good Dorset band of volunteers started recording. Um, the numbers, basically, if you look at the trend, the blue line for the total count per year, by and large, that's still heading up. So the total number of butterflies as the habitat starts to mature, and I reckon it's still got another 30, 40, maybe 50 years before it starts looking like chalk downland. But uh, as it starts to mature, I would guess the numbers will, will level off somewhere. But at the moment, the, just the numbers on balance over the years, subject to some fluctuations, just seem to be heading up. Numbers of species, we've plateaued at 30. Um, I'm not going to list them, but you know, we're missing uh, grayling, green hair streak, I think would be a couple that might venture forth and establish. Um, but maybe we've, maybe we've got to as many as we're going to, to, to get. We, we haven't got a total list of of, of, you know, a full list of chalk grassland plants. 
and and I think species as the scrub starts to emerge in the next 10 years or so I think uh, I think more species will arrive where there's a little bit more shelter uh, oh dark green frit for instance that's not there well there's hardly any any um any dog violet there at the moment but I guess it will come in and maybe somebody will introduce it at some point the plant so who knows um, but uh, but you know 30 maybe it'll get up to 36 species in, an, in another 10 years or so but fantastic now just as an aside I've mentioned already the amount of mowing that is not done on the Weymouth Relief Road and I've been working with um, Dr Sarah Wynne from ADAS because most organizations and certainly local government and national government are very interested in greenhouse gas emissions and we are all desperately trying to work our way towards net zero by particular timelines and that means simply not using as much fuel to do the sorts of things which we regularly do this low topsoil specification that I advocate now nationally um, is something that uh, definitely helps organizations reduce the amount of fuel they use in either creating green spaces or after that looking after them so if you look at the bar chart on the far right that very low pale blue bar is the total amount of greenhouse gas emissions used in creating that stunning butterfly habitat you've just had a look at if you look on the left bar the tall bar the dark blue shows you the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that are used in hauling the topsoil and smearing it over the slopes um, uh, during the construction. And then the pale blue is the amount of greenhouse gas emissions used in mowing it twice a year, which is pretty much the standard maintenance for, say, an urban dual carriageway or an urban fast road. Um, if you were out on a motorway, then that might be mown at once every two, three to five years, and that's the the middle bar in 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 the of the bar chart. But basically, the difference between the low topsoil specification on the right and the standard maximum amount of mowing that you do on the left is a is a reduction of 97% in greenhouse gas emissions. Frankly, this is a no-brainer, and I'll come on to who's already kind of caught this hook line and sinker in a bit but this is something we absolutely have to do basically we only want to put topsoil where we want mown grass for playing fields for 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 hard wearing grasses the rest of it frankly should be low fertility to include wildflowers so we increase wildlife so we've got an awful lot of of, of green spaces that we've already committed to 150 mil of topsoil and we keep having to mow them is there any way we can reduce lower that fertility on existing amenity grasslands and of course there is and what i did when i was put in charge of the uh, green space services was to change the way that the grasses are mown from cut and drop mowers to cut and collect mowers so those are mowers that pick up the grass as they're going along and you will all have seen many places and indeed some of you will be doing it in your garden you will be cutting the grass and not picking up the clippings um, the the principle here is that the nutrients that grasses need to grow are coming from the soil beneath and that happens in the spring and the summer and if you allow the grass to grow really long in the spring before you do your first cut you are sucking the nutrients out of the soil and a lot of nutrients will come out of the soil into the green grass blades and the flowers and the seeds and if you then take them away they can't go back into the soil and therefore it's almost miraculous but you're taking away that fertility and as a result of that the change can be remarkably quick and indeed you can probably reduce the amount of certainly mowing done in uh, municipal areas by about half in, in a couple of years. And the great thing about that is that once the wildflowers are established, if you're not cutting as much, they can flower and set seed between the cuts. So here's the uh, specification that I prefer, having tried it out with my stuff, is that if you're going to go into a new road verge or a public park or indeed in bits of your garden where you've been cutting 
and just doing cutting and drop mowing is you need to go in there and and go in there a bit harsh for the first year reduce that fertility with three cut and collects during the first year and in southern britain and certainly is certainly up as far as hertfordshire i would suggest sometime in april july and september to do that cutting um, and when you've done that so let the grass get as long as you can before your mower can't cope then go and take it away and the following year you've depleted the nutrient levels in in the soil so much that actually you will instantly see that the coarse grasses have declined the fine grasses so so your fescues and your and your bents agrostis they have come in and instantly you can see and even in this picture here this is mid-may for a verge that would normally be cut at the beginning of April. No need to cut, it's, it's doing beautifully and it's full of daisies. So you've already started that process by which common wildflowers can self-establish in, uh, in, these, in these verges or in parks. And it's just a very simple change in the way that we uh, deal with the management of the grassland. And just a few examples now just so you know that this system actually does work so here's a this is a um a verge in blandford so uh in in the town in blandford just an ordinary verge nowhere in special um and that was last cut in mid-june late june and this photograph was taken in october so here's a very neat tidy verge that simply hasn't required mowing for several months and that, of course, means that you can see a few yarrows. Um, uh, you know, diversity, biodiversity takes a while to get back in. But even those yarrows will be providing some nectar for invertebrates in the meantime, um, during the time when it's not being mown. And that's a, a big, big change for our pollinators and for our butterflies and moths within urban environments. Um, here's one uh, in my own town in, in Weymouth. So this is after four years of cut and collect. Um, now this is a rough hawk's beard that's uh, mainly in abundance here in May, but also lots of oxide daisy and ordinary daisies and dandelions. Um, there's so little grass left in this verge now, it's almost all wildflowers. Well, isn't that what we want? So from a safety point of view, this presents no problems. And from a nectar point of view, this is an abundant nectar bar now for, for any bees and the rest of it. So it's a, it's a very simple transformation. Um, that, that is now in progress throughout virtually all the major towns in Dorset, apart from Dorchester and Sherborne, but we're working on it. Um, and after five years, so here's a chalky bypass. So this is around Blandford, the A354 for anybody who comes down that way into Dorset. Um, <clears throat> this site's now been under a cut and collect regime for five years and so full of wildflowers and indeed loads and loads of marble whites and common blues and narrow bordered five spot burnet moths. So full of wildflowers that uh, the Dorset Wildlife Trust have now declared this as a county wildlife site. When I took on the management of this site as the service manager, the mowing regime was three times a year. It is now one cut and collect a year, that's it. So we've instantly saved a load of cash and delivered a lot of biodiversity. <coughs> And now looking at back to that first slide that I showed you, of which you would prefer, here's a created site. So this was gang mown grassland. The grassland had been created. You, you see lots of this in new urban development where you've got aprons, little triangles and circles and uh, of, of grassland that just gets gang mown. Um, we did the three cut and collects in the first year. And at the end of that first season, sowed a very simple wildflower mix of oxide daisy, of um, uh, common knapweed, bird's foot trefoil and some yellow rattle. <clears throat> and then continued that cut and collect the following year, just once or twice. 18 months later, this is what it was looking like in 2019. And now these areas are just part of part of the urban fabric. These are mini nature reserves that are that are providing some uh, you know, widespread good, but quite good habitat for our more common and widespread species. And now there are plenty of ringlets and gatekeeper and marbled white and all the rest of it breeding in this ground where previously it had been gang mown for about six times a year and was just boring grassland. So we really can do this and we can do this at scale almost anywhere 
in the country. <coughs> Excuse me. I often get people saying, oh, yeah, but what about when it comes to municipal lawns? So here's um, an example, again, not far from me in Weymouth. Uh, this was taken last summer um, in an area where Asta Property, who are now the, uh, the, uh, the maintenance company who look after the social housing in Weymouth, and they've swapped on to cut and collect. Um, and uh, where they go cut and collect, of course, they don't need to mow as often but they're still maintaining a very neat and tidy look to the setting of these social houses. But look at the wildflowers. This is predominantly bird, common bird's foot trefoil in there. And if you go out there in the middle of the summer, there are common blues flying around on the grassland. There are not necessarily lots of them, but they're there and they're breeding there. So even under a, you know, even maintaining a fairly steady amount of cutting and collecting of three times a year, that's that gives the opportunity for the flowers and for the butterflies to get in there. And even on a what looks like a lawn is sufficiently flowery to be able to allow common and widespread species to establish and thrive. And and uh, as was mentioned before um, uh, uh, by um, in, in the questions about No Mo May, No Mo May is, um, is an initiative by Plant Life, which is encouraging gardeners not to mow in May and to go and look and count the number of wildflowers that are flowering in their lawns. And I think that's a great initiative and I think it's um, an important one. I think we should be going even further than that. And I spend my time trying to persuade people that actually what you need to do is to get in there early in the year. And if the grass is lush by the end of March, go and cut and collect it. Take it away. We don't want lush grass. We want some fine grasses. I'm very happy with grass because let's face it, lots of lots of our butterflies feed on grasses. But we just don't need the amount of grass in the abundance that it is. So go early in the year and take that cut away and then leave it May to August and then go and take another cut towards the end of it. And you'll be really surprised at just how many species of butterfly you will see within the garden. And obviously not everybody wants to do that, but I am certainly a massive proponent of encouraging people to do that. So my view is, yeah, no mo May, yeah, that's fine, but why not no mo May to August? So. There are all sorts of issues with that and put them in the chat and the rest of it. But disposal of the arisings is the big one. That's more a problem in municipal areas rather than in gardens. But uh, we found solutions for all of these issues in Dorset. And, and I you know, discuss, I spend hours discussing that with other local authorities uh, and with national agencies of where to put the arisings, how to do it legally, how to avoid it becoming waste, how to stop fly tipping, all of that sort of thing. But all of those issues are resolvable. There is nothing in principle to stop organizations from cutting and collecting grass to encourage the wildflowers. So things that I think if we're serious about wanting more insects and we want our butterflies and moths out there, the key do's and don'ts. My view is that we have to reduce soil fertility and we have to allocate that space for nature. It isn't just, you know, we don't just want little pocket parks for nature. We want to say, right, this whole system, this whole park or this whole set of road verges is being managed with wildlife in mind. So those things. So it's about reducing soil fertility and it's about demarking where we where we're expecting nature to be to be given. You know, a helping hand. The other thing that we, what I would hope that we can resist doing if we possibly can, is actually just stop mowing. And and um, uh, that's a common campaign out there. And it's a lack of understanding in my view of the ecosystem that we're working with is if you encourage your local authority just to stop mowing as much, then the view that you see before you is sometimes what they end up with is that yes you've got plenty of wildflowers in there there's lots of creeping thistle and there's some wild carrot and some yarrow and there's some ragwort but present that to the maintenance crews at the end of the year or to the park rangers 
and they simply don't know what to do. The kit that they have is not capable of looking after that length of sward. Where on earth do they take all of that dead material at the end of the year? And how are they going to maintain that site in the public interest with the public backing in order to look after it? It's really hard. But if you reduce the fertility, the stuff just doesn't grow as much and you get this, you get the same number or more wildflower species. So it's about just it's not just about stopping mowing. You have to get on top of the fertility. And the other thing that I keep banging on about is please, please don't consider planting annual flower mixes as in anything like a substitute for our perennial native wildflowers because they are not. There is not one single species of butterfly or moth that has anything to do with wild poppy, which we consider to be a native species in this country, but it isn't. It's an archaeophyte. It was introduced here. So even something as fundamental as a poppy that we love to see in the fields offers very little to wildlife other than bumblebees and nectar. So, so we need to think about our native perennial wildflowers as being far, far more important. However much the Olympic mix, the, the pictorial meadow mix was wonderful. It looked spectacular and fantastic, but it was there as a visual spectacle, not as a wildlife haven. And if you go back to the Olympic Park today, you can see what they have done to create now a wildlife haven. They understood the system they were creating. They understood why they were creating that wonderful show. But if you go back now and have a look, you will see native perennial wildflowers that have taken over and are being managed for. And it is simply staggering. So the, uh, the lot who look after the Olympic Park are to be congratulated um, in getting this right first time. So well done them. Right, it's really important to have the community on board. You know, we're butterfly and moth nuts. We're out there doing what we can to, to conserve. And, and that's great. But, but actually, there are a whole lot of people there who don't either understand or aren't very willing and may look at the view in this picture and say, gosh, that's a mess. So it's really important to bring people on board. And as you know, within Big City Butterflies and what you've been doing within Brilliant Butterflies project in um, Croydon and Bromley is to encourage people to get engaged so they start to understand what it is to look after wildlife in an urban landscape. And that's a, a really important part of, goes hand in hand with the work that we want to do, is to inform and engage with communities about why we're so passionate about what we are. Just a quickie on budgets. You know, I started off when I took over the service in Dorset for with £927,000 to look after road verges in Dorset. This coming year, that budget has now reduced to £501,000. So probably within the next three to four years, the verge management budget for Dorset will have halved as a result of moving along the line towards reducing fertility across the grassland. Um, uh, on, on all the verges. I mean, it is a staggering amount of money that has been saved as a result of this uh, change. I didn't know it would be this powerful, but it really is. And I commend it to all local authorities. They just have to do it because why would you want to waste money where you don't have to? And why would you want to waste money when the consequence of doing something different is to produce biodiversity? Much of this is set out in um, the uh, Managing Grass and Road Verges Plant Life Guide. And uh, as well as that, there is now a new uh, Good Verge Guide that uh, Plant Life have produced. So if you go onto their website, both those documents are available. But just before I end, I just wanted to give you um, a little update on Highways England, who are frankly very convinced by my arguments over um, um, uh, low fertility soils and they have now issued uh, what they call a major project instruction on low nutrient grasslands and that all their new big new road schemes that are managed directly by Highways England will no longer have any topsoil associated with them and like it or not because I don't suppose any of us will lose any sleep if no more roads are built in this country but given that they are going to be built the next 300 miles of grassland on road verges will be based on low fertility soils. 
And in my view, that's 300 miles of wildflower habitats, which is absolutely stunning. So Highways England are convinced, and, and it's now very important that we capitalize on this initiative taken by Highways England and roll that out as far as we can. Um, just a quickie on, on, you know, we're working in urban environments. Uh, can wildflower grasslands contribute to human health? I think for those of us who are out there doing day-to-day -day management and monitoring, we recognize the mental health benefits, but it does go beyond that. And one of the, uh, the things that I'm interested in is in, um, is in uh, uh, the associations between species diversity and well-being, and whether that can be mediated by, um, by what's going on in your internal systems, by your gut microbial ecosystem, uh, your microbiome. And there is at least reasonable circumstantial evidence that your microbiome diversity, which is correlated, um, um, uh, it, it, the more diverse your microbiome, the less chronic inflammatory disease at a population level that you are, that you appear to be associated with. Now, we don't know whether that's a causal link, but my view is if there is anything about biodiversity that can contribute at a population scale to improving human health, then we ought to be putting that into place now. And there are a couple of references at the bottom there which give you the uh, evidence statement. And these are not kind of knotty evidence statements. One of these is produced by DEFRA. This is the evidence statement for links between natural environments and human health. There is ever stronger evidence that we need the more diverse an environment in which we live, the more likely we are to have long and fulfilled lives with less chronic disease. And I think we would all say yes to that. So conclusions. Well, my view is, is we need to look at all of our urban grasslands as an ecosystem. And if we think of that system of, you know, well, why does grass grow? How do we stop it growing? Are there any effects of that? If we look at the way we design and manage our, uh, our amenity grasslands as, 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 uh, as spaces for wildlife, then, then we can understand how that ecosystem um, helps you know, helps drive the, 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 the biodiversity that we want. And, and from my point of view, it's all about low fertility. It basically stops the grass needing such frequent mowing and wildflowers naturally thrive in it. And therefore, you know, it does deliver the bio wildlife benefits we want. The greenness of there, they, the, the verges, the, the parks and the rest of it continue to perform their intended function. People can go out there and sit amongst them or walk on them or they're safe to, to travel alongside. They can be neat and tidy without compromising that wildlife value. And they are frankly demonstrably cheaper to look after and in doing so contribute to uh, reduction in, uh, in our greenhouse gas emissions, which we all want to see. Okay, thank you very much. That is me done. I will stop sharing. Thanks, Phil. That's a really inspiring talk. We've got some great comments coming through in the um, in the comments box. Um, I think I'll open out to questions in, in a minute. But um, one of, one of the one of the points people are making is uh, how you know, is is just why why aren't all councils doing this and how how can we how what can we do to encourage councils to 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 do more? I know in our local area that. For some time they didn't cut verges and a lot of people complained about the number of weeds that were growing outside their house so how how yeah you know, what what can we do to get more councils behaving in the way that we want them to well i mean that's a that's a very good uh, uh, it's it's a very good point it i mean it's hard i think um part of it is who runs parks and verge management. I mean, let's take verges, for instance. The majority of local authority staff who look after verges are either highways staff or contractors on behalf of highway staff. We shouldn't be too surprised if they don't really understand the ecosystem that we're trying to work with. Um, I, I no disrespect to them, but to be honest, most of the response to the grass has grown longer is that we put in bigger and heavier machinery to cut it. 
So, so you know, it, it, it's about how you respond to the issues that you face. As an ecologist, I look at the ecosystem and say, we need to respond to this ecosystem and work with the grain of nature to help us get to where we want to be, not shove in bigger and heavier and more expensive machinery. So working with local government is partly what I am doing in this project. And please, no better example of I think some of the enlightened approaches that are being taken than by Buckinghamshire Council. So frankly, next door to Hertfordshire, is it? Yeah, pretty much, isn't it? So Buckinghamshire yeah. Council um, uh, this coming year are changing the way they are going to be managing their verges. They're going to do it as a trial, but they have got their contractor with cut and collect machinery to work on them on some of the A roads, particularly the major approaches to the towns um, where they are going to move from cut and drop to cut and collect. They recognize and want as, and this is the engineers, this is the highways management lot, recognize that, that they need to do more for biodiversity, but they absolutely understand the cost savings that they are likely to, to follow on from this. And also the increase in the safety of the highway because they are having to, as all local authorities do on high speed roads, send men and machinery out at night to mow the verges. And that is costly and it is to some extent risky. Um, and and uh, if they can reduce the cost and reduce the risk, then why wouldn't they? So it's basically for me and for others to go out and promote to local government that there is another way is that basically I mean it's very easy to talk to park rangers and talk to them about an ecosystem they seem to understand it and I think we've had some good success already in London um, and I kind of know no better than London Borough of Lambeth um, uh, you know Brockwell Park is brilliant now where there are areas set aside under cut and collect uh, for for um, for widespread species of butterflies and the rest of it, and people enjoying being in these areas, which are now left a bit longer. That's where they prefer to congregate because they see wildlife and they're enjoying being amongst it. So, it's it's relatively straight. It's relatively easy. But on the big highways, we have a lot of uh, a, a lot of um, education to do. But that's what I'm doing. And I would say, you know, Cornwall Council are changing. South Gloucestershire Council. Um, uh, Stirling Council in Scotland, um, uh, St Andrews, so that's Fife Council. They're, they're scattered all around the country. Oh, the latest one, Newcastle City Council, um, rang me just last week to say, we bought one of these uh, cut and collect machines. We've got 10 trial areas. Can we have a quote for our press release, please? I didn't even know they were doing it. Fantastic. So the message is out there and things are changing. But remember, you've got a historical service that, you know, contract. The easiest thing to do in the world is to issue a contract to mow verges. Mm. And 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 because nobody it just it just gets done automatically. And you just pay the bill at the end of the year and nobody fusses um, to change that historical pattern takes time. Sometimes contracts are issued for 10 or 15 years. And there are penalty clauses if you have to if you change the contract. But slowly and surely, change is happening. And and um, the latest evidence from plant life is that is it 70% of local authorities are either wanting to change or actively changing now their road verge management regime. Now I'd like to see the data to see how good that is, but but uh, that is um, uh, you know we we're on a mission. And I think if you think your local authority in your area isn't doing well enough, then put them in touch with me. That's what I would say. Well, well the people are putting a lot of comments in about their lone local authorities. Yep. Um, I mean, uh, which which I will awful, gather. <laughs> we do have an awful lot of them in this area, which yeah. include about half the London boroughs and yep. um, Hertfordshire County Council and 10 district councils in yeah. Hertfordshire. So we've probably got about... 20 well 22 23 24 altogether how, how much engagement have you had with those well um fairly recently so it'll be a sometime before christmas i think it was early december i spoke to um the group known as park hearts um which are, are, are an amalgam it's um uh, um 
a, a gathering of the local authorities that look after the management of parks and open spaces and some road verges th that cover North London uh, over to Suffolk and across to um, across to Hertfordshire. Um, and uh, yes, I think there was there was more than interest in what I had to say, but I have to say of all the groups that I did speak to, it wasn't one where I got an immediate buy in. And it may, I just wonder whether there isn't, um, it, it's almost as if, I mean, am I, am I allowed to say this? Well, let's try and see, is that I couldn't quite see that the pressure was on those particular local authorities to save money and do the right thing. It almost felt like it was a bit too much hassle to change. Um, I might be wrong, but I've got some local authorities who are constantly in touch with me because they absolutely need to save the money and they recognize the benefits to the wildlife. I, I just didn't quite get that, that instant success with Park Hearts, but it may be that there are some within the area that are doing the right thing. What I would say is that uh, London Borough Redbridge um, uh, there's, um, they, they did seem to be on it. Now, others may say about Redbridge, there's a particular guy whose name escapes me, somebody or other Castro, who's their park ranger. Um, but he was, he seemed very switched on. And, and I have to well, say- that's one been... of the project boroughs for big city butterflies. It is, not it? in our area. So um, we don't have any direct dealings with them. I mean, we've yeah. had, comments being made about good things happening in Stevenage. Um, yep. I know they've had rewilding projects going for quite a long time. Um, and in uh, Hemel, Hemel Hempstead, Chris Ridley saying that uh, yep. they've been quite good. And I know I've spoken with the Decorum Council, that is on um, various yep. wildflower projects that they're hoping to, um, to get going. I know in, in St Albans, where I live, there, there's a huge pressure to cut, cut funds at present but they have recently um, allocated £100,000 to um, a wilder St Albans project, which is uh, not cutting verges, is quite a key part of that. And they're employing a project officer um, who's in the process of being recruited at present to, to oversee that project. So it seems there's quite a lot going on. I mean, one, one, from what you said, one of the things I wondered whether it, we're better at, off aiming at, at um, of verges that aren't in built up areas to start with because there's, there's probably less people are going to complain if it's not outside their house yeah well you know that's a really interesting thought um is that i mean personally i think i have the opposite view is that actually from my point of view i want to put people and wildlife together and i know that's going to be a bumpy road but actually that for me is probably a, um, a more important driver than, uh, you know, I just want engagement of people and wildlife. And that's why I'm really excited about Big City Butterflies, because it's just, it's going to kind of, that crash of getting people engaged with wildlife is right there. Um, so I also think that, that urban wildlife, urban verges uh, and urban parks are the things that get mauled so much. You know, they just get constantly mown. Um, where is it? It's in Hackney, London Borough of Hackney. Some of the grasslands in London Borough of Hackney are being mown 22 times a year. That's utterly outrageous. What an utter waste of money that is. Now, they are really keen um, on, on, on moving towards cut and collect and reducing that and they see the obvious amount of you know if they could remove from 22 cuts a year down to two cuts a year on a cut and collect why wouldn't they do that and so i think for for, for i'd rather go for that sort of head 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 to head of, of persuading people that this is something they should do in urban areas mm -hmm. in rural areas absolutely i think if we can do it and i'd point you to lincolnshire where in the Lincolnshire Wolds, uh, those beautiful wide verges, um, which some of which were already pretty good for wildflowers, um, the, where those old drove roads where they used to drive the sheep down from the um, from the hills down into the plains, um, those verges are now on. Most of those are on cut and collect, and that's a, a, a joint project with the Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust and Lincolnshire County Council, and with local farmers and with the prospect of some of that material going into biogas production. So Lincolnshire have really gone into that uh, rural verge maintenance for wildflowers. 
and amazing. You know, they're doing some really good stuff. But it's, I, I don't know, it's harder, partly because local authorities spend less on rural verge management. So there's in some respects less to save. There may be more to gain because there are fewer complaints, but actually it's, it's just, it's that balance. It's also finding the kit. There are a lot of rural verges and you do end up with a lot of grass and you've got to do something with it. And so, Andrew we made the point that there's, uh, we've got count, count, a lot of council elections coming up in the next um, next month or two. I think May, isn't it, that they're, they're on in yes, Hartford, I'm not so sure, in London. And that would be a great opportunity to be lobbying councillors about it. Well, there's do, a, do you think the, that's the best route in to lobby councillors rather than going for officials? Oh, I, I do. Uh, look, the the um, from my point of view, the, the greatest success I had at Dorset County Council was 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 um, well, I was an officer there um, was was access to members. Members are the conduit between, you know, the community who elect them and the officers. If if you can get to members to be able to influence uh, and they're all keen. There aren't many members who are going to turn around and say, no, we don't want to save money. No, we don't want to add wildlife. I mean, what, what, those are two big important agendas for most, uh, uh, for most uh, members. And I would have thought this is a fine time to be doing it. And uh, there are mayoral elections um, in London, of course, this, uh, this, this spring. I, have, I, I had a look at um, the manifestos uh, for some, but I can't. I I couldn't quote to them to you now. Maybe Simon can, but um, but uh, you, you know, it basically for for organisations like TFL, um, I mean, they are signed up to deliver more biodiversity. So one of my um, one of my fave clients at the moment are TFL. TFL organised a road verge conference two weeks ago, um, to bring people together across the London boroughs and for Connect Plus services in the M25 because they want to see coordination of better management for wildlife across the road version network in London. That's TFL organized that. That wouldn't have happened two or three years ago. You know, there's change happening out there and, and any way you can encourage elected members to see the benefits, then, then please do and encourage them, you know, your local ones, send them to the link to this talk that I've just given. And, uh, and yeah, get them to exactly. contact me. We certainly will. And yeah. um, we've had one suggestion that a good way to reach people would go on to Spring Watch. Isn't Chris Packham supposed to be a vice president of Bus by wow. Conservation or something? Why aren't you on there saying this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would love to be. If anybody can kind of wave that magic wand. Um, I've had not Spring Watch so much. Um, uh, Spring Watch is carefully guarded, isn't it? Spring Watch is quite is relatively formulaic. Um, I think they ought to be doing something on this, but uh, but they haven't. I think yet. I managed to get on there last year without you too were much trouble. Top and quality. They, they phoned you up for a comment on what I was saying. So yeah, they, they did. Got but, your phone number. Uh, they have got my <laughs> phone number. Look, uh, I, they haven't done it yet. Um, the only other possibility was the one show, and I've had three attempts at getting on the one show. Now, some some people love the one show, some people don't. I just thought it is an opportunity, um, but. It hasn't happened yet, but um, it may yet do. So, so probably watch this space. But um, yeah, it, that some of these things are blindingly obvious. And when you walk out onto onto your nice, I mean, if you walk out onto the Weymouth Relief Road, uh, end of May and early June, it's alive with butterflies. Mm. I mean, why wouldn't everybody? I mean, I had one dear person from Natural England in tears because she'd never seen so many butterflies since she was a child you know I'm, i mean they were marble whites as they do flopping around your feet when they're in big numbers wonderful um but it is evocative it does bring back memories and 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 i think it's important that people yes you want to talk to them but they have also got to see it for themselves and and the more organizations that start doing this the better right cool Okay, well, look, um, I think we're, um, we're probably at time when we ought to um, stop for the next interval. Um, I'll, we'll try and find a way of sharing the comments with you. Because there's well, well, a, a yes, lot what I'm going to do, different councils. Yeah, what I will do is um, I, I'll, I'll start responding to those comments while, while the rest of the, whilst the, rest of the, um, okay. the afternoon is going on. And, and I can also copy and paste from that, so I'll hang on to them. I can think. Also, I'll, I'll be downloading the log for the 
meeting so I can send you the comments as well. Um, oh, just brilliant. to also let you know, Zoe is ar has arrived. So Zoe is now somewhere in the number of all the... Hello, Zoe. So, nice to see you again today. <laughs> I know this is my third Zoom meeting of the day, and it's the last one before I go on holiday. <laughs> third of the day. Oh, look, I, I've got two today. You've got three. I did one last <laughs> night, one the night meeting. before. We are in huge demand, that Zoe and I. It's great. Love it. <laughs> it's just exhausting. <laughs> You're getting your messages across. That's the best yep. thing. That's, that's what we do. <laughs> Excellent. Well, look, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Malcolm and 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 Liz for inviting me and um, been brilliant to talk to you all. I look forward to seeing some of you at, uh, you know, I do want to come up to Greenwood Park this this spring if we're allowed out to play. Um, it'll be, be and, and I really look forward to hearing. I mean, is that right? No small blue yet? Is that right? Sorry, I dropped out for a moment. Oh, there, sorry. But, so um, no, no, no small blue yeah, at Greenwood Park. Yeah, but anyway, there we go. Well, um, no, there isn't. <laughs> no, no, there isn't. Not okay, yet. not yet. Not well, I, well, I, I really hope it's this year, and and you know, congratulations. It's a brilliant site, and and it will be good in due course. Okay, thank you. Right, as just possible, Mark. Oh no, Malcolm is just having a bit of trouble with his he connection. Is, I think. Um, um, he's he's on mute. Keep cutting in and out. Sorry. Um, I was just saying, um, we'll have an interval for 15 minutes and I'll, I'll share share my screen with some information about how people can get involved in um, helping helping the group. We'll, uh, we'll start again in, uh, with Zoe in 15 minutes time. Remember that the, uh, the voting for the photo competition will finish at uh, four o'clock, so this is your last chance. What a spectacular, inspirational talk. Absolutely, Brian. Absolutely. I love to be outside on sunny warm spring days but i'm so glad i stayed in and listened to this it's really good really good unfortunately my my local authority isn't very good at listening to things like that well, my, would... my local people know who i am now and so i'm going to share this with them yeah. maybe we can get something started well, I'm going to try and get it. I'm going to get onto my subject leader meeting and also um, uh, the meeting where we've got all the science consultants and advisors in London. Because they can take it back to their schools. And if their schools do that, they know they've got their lawns. That will be even better. Well, a few years ago, the Environmental Protection Agency, which is national, and the Massachusetts uh, Highway Division. I was in contact with them at, to give them in, information on which butterflies visit which wildflowers at which season. They didn't have any of that information, but they were developing a, a program to make little butterfly sanctuaries along the roadsides, the verges. So they have to hear this now. Maybe they know it already. I hope they do. I haven't really looked carefully, but... It was so eye-opening. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. Oof. Everybody else has gone to the bathroom, I guess. <laughs> I think I'm going to make a cup of tea, I must admit. <laughs> I'm not going, I'll just take my picture off, but I'll still be here. I can still hear you if you want to talk. It's all gone quiet. So I've put up the um, 
That is not correct. Put up the slide with some of the information about things we could help. We can help with. Good. Very good. Another one coming in a minute. Um, A great meeting so far, Malcolm. Thanks, Brian. Welcome. But, um, yeah, I mean, it was really good working with Phil on um, the Greenwood Park Butterfly Bank. He, you know, he was very knowledgeable and helped us to um, make some improvements to the original design, as well as giving us some uh, some seeds from Weymouth to uh, to plant on the bank. So <laughs> I think. Um, yeah, there's a there's a hell of a lot more we could do. It's the the main thing is getting um, trying to get enough engagement with uh, with with the different councils. There are just so many of them, um, yeah. and they tend not to respond particularly well to people writing that aren't in their actual area. So, yeah. I'm wondering what what we should do is to try and um, send a letter to to each council, but perhaps. Um, I don't know, maybe send it from someone that actually lives in that council area. We certainly got members in each each borough. I'd be happy for that to happen, Malcolm. I'd send it to Harrah. <laughs> I'll send it to my local MP. He knows me well. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think was it someone put a comment in saying they were having trouble with Harrow. Yeah, with you or with Mark? With no, it wasn't me. It was somebody else. Mar I'm Mar Mar Margaret, surprised. I think, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not surprised. But yeah, maybe if you put a draft letter together and sent it to everybody and we could all send mm. it to the councils, that would be a good thing, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of, a lot of people have been on this for a while because it has been um, quite a live issue. Mm. But it, as I say, when, um, you know, when St Albans Council stopped cutting the, uh, the verges for um, the first three months of the year, there were... You know, the local paper got onto it as to what a scandal it was and was regularly running articles about gosh you won't guess how long the grass is this year and getting people happens. writing complaining about it you know it was <laughs> well, it well was Corrine, not, uh, not not well explained i think because they just stopped corinne has stopped doing it corinne has the ear so of, of educators all over britain she she i told you this before but she was the head of ase which has fifty five thousand members teachers and educators, and perhaps they could get the word out through their students into their parents, you know, bailiwick and get them in interested in this project, a different group than the old white guys like us, a, a different group, you know, uh, not necessarily the taxpayers, but the, but there's a young girl in uh, in Norway who's made a giant difference in the world, and perhaps uh, 10 million students in England can make a difference if we got them involved somehow. It's a yeah, giant well, task. Very, it's very much the centre of what we're doing with the Big City Butterflies project, right. as, you, right. as we've explained. That that's right. um, that's aimed at getting into um, right. you know, getting into schools and children and getting them to show a lot of interest in butterflies and wildflowers. So yeah. we're putting a lot of effort, money, and effort into it. Yes, I know. It's excellent. Mm. I think what we need to what we need to do is try and find a way to engage with um, engage with um, schools generally. That's you know that's something which we we've, we've not been great at as a group. I'll move I'll move the slide on to the to the next one now as well. More ways you can help. Yeah, actually, Michael, um, uh, Malcolm, sorry. Um, I could certainly get this on the agenda for all the science advisors and consultants that work in London. Mm -hmm. And that would help because they have access then to the teachers who then have access to the children. Yeah, well, that would be really helpful. Um, I mean, I think 
I don't know whether whether Phil has prepared materials that are specifically aimed at, at schools, but I'll can I can ask him. I don't know if he's still on the call or not. I don't think you need to. I think I think um, if he if um, talking about you know just not cutting the grass. Schools cut cut their grass, and that's the caretaker does that mm. regularly. And you can get them to do things like that. Young children are very interested in growing things and seeing wildlife. So you could start in that way. Yeah, I mean, we, we worked closely with the, the local school at Greenwood Park and got the children to um, to grow things and brought them out and showed them the, the plants on the on the butterfly bank as well. It, it, it did attract a lot of interest. Um, but we in that case, we had a, a staff group that was very engaged and very keen themselves. I, I think it probably, you know, it, it, it's, there's all sorts of reasons which make it difficult for us to deal with children unless we've got sort of the staff on board as well. Well, if you if you if they talk to the people who advise and support the teachers, which is this group, then that would be quite a useful mm. thing to do because you'll get an uptake. I mean, yeah. I've done that before they, they've done you know big bug hunt is phenomenal. Um, you know, growing seeds that were taken to space, low thousands of schools. So there are ways of doing it. Yeah. Okay. Well, do you want to? Can you drop me an email or something afterwards? So I've got your contact details, and then we'll um, we can yes. see what we can do about it. Yes, I will. Got you right in the middle, Corinne. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> you both make things happen, so this is very good. Both of you, excellent. Well, this guy Phil is really a, quite a treasure. Yeah, I mean he's an he's an incredibly knowledgeable um, lepidopterist as well. I, mean, I skated over his authorships, but I mean he's he's written um, a, a joint author of a leading text on book on micromoths covering yeah. you know, all the UK species, um, yeah. as well as another text on caterpillars, which yeah. is equally authoritative. So you know he really is at at the top of his game as an entomologist as well as a He's been very, very good advocate for um, wildflowers on verges. Yeah, his knowledge of moths is exceptional as well. So, um, you know, he is am quite amazing. So it's very, very difficult anywhere in the world to find a very good scientist who can speak very well for wildlife and is, is comfortable doing so. That's male or female. That's an extraordinary combination to have. Yeah, well, we've um, we found one, um, yep. so um, hopefully another couple of minutes we'll find another one. Yeah, yeah, there we go. <laughs> That's right. So my favorite, but my favorite English butterfly book is the is the cent uh, the centennial uh, the millennial atlas. I love that. <laughs> I learned so much about British butterflies from looking at that book. It's, it's amazing. So this is about the next atlas, right? So it's about this one. There we go. There <laughs> we go. That, that's it. That's right. Fantastic. Where's my copy? See, I got it. Right there. There it is. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right next to Migration of Butterflies by Williams. <laughs> Looks I, like there's space in there to squeeze in a moth atlas as well. Uh, yeah, there is. <laughs> there is. Uh, you know, I was just, I, I uh, have a friend named Tom Murray. I live in Massachusetts and I have a friend named Tom Murray. And he's a wonderful guy. He delivers truck parts for a living, but his passion is uh, backyard wildlife. And he has a, web, a photographic website that more than 30 million hits on. Wow. And He's seen over 1,600 species of moths in his yard and photographed and shared. And it's, he's an amazing guy, quiet, the quietest guy. <laughs> he's as quiet as a moth. But he, <laughs> he, he just found a new moth last night at this yard. <laughs> he, always, he always tells me when he does. And he's, he's a fantastic authority, but you know, he's one of the few people I know that when you write to him, 
the email, he answers you. And he invites me to his house and I go up and look at them all. Okay. Yes, so, I'm sorry. I'm I go. think we're um, running over into next session, Brian. So um, if, um, if we could um, maybe just um, hold that for a bit later. Um, so um, photographic competition has now ended. Um, the votes will be counted and uh, we'll announce the outcome at the end of the uh, end of this session. Um, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Zoe Randall. Um, like Dr. Phil, Dr. Zoe is a doctor of philosophy. Uh, she's also spent much of her time in Dorset um, and works for butterfly conservation and very keen about butterflies and moths. Um, Zoe works um, as the senior surveys officer for butterfly conservation, so is responsible for counting, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of butterflies and moths each year, but maybe she'll tell us. Um, her favourite moth is the elephant hawk moth, um, because it is pink and fluffy, everything you wouldn't expect in a moth, she said in a recent interview. So Zoe, over to you, um, if you unmute and then um, we can um, hear your talk. Yeah, so I am. Um, oh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. So I've I've hit a glitch straight away. <laughs> I don't know Hold if on. you can enable that for me. Yes, that should be okay now. Hopefully. Oh, brilliant! There it is. Yeah, super job. Let's, right. It should be coming up. Yeah, I can see it. Hope the others can too. There we go. Right, I'll just close this little thing down here as well. So I'm not in the way. Oh, knickers, we're going too fast. Right, super job. Well, thanks ever so much for um, having me along this afternoon to speak to you all about the Moth Atlas. I was scheduled to speak to you last year, but we obviously all got cancelled. So, um, so you've got me this year instead. So hopefully it's been worth waiting for. So we um, published this fantastic atlas of Britain and Ireland's larger moths in November 2019 and I'm glad to say it was mission accomplished and what a mission it was. Um, a lot of endurance was required and despite feeling stuck in pack ice at times we weren't crushed under the pressure unlike Shackleton's ship named Endurance and uh, and one of the other interesting things I discovered during this Moth Atlas uh, journey was that Atlas was the god of endurance. And uh, yeah, we endured, but we got there. And like all epic journeys, you meet amazing people along the way. There's gains and losses and, uh, you know, and there's a lot of personal growth involved. And, uh, and our lives basically are in this book. So all good project managers have a uh, timeline and we set up a timeline. We set up several timelines and uh, in the end, everything was slipping and we just abandoned ship with the, with the timeline and just got on with it. And as Einstein said, the only reason for time is so that everything doesn't happen at once. And I'm pleased to say we finally got there and I'm gonna tell you how we got there. Well, one of the first jobs we needed to do was source images of moths. And this was quite tricky because they needed to be sat on a suitable background. They had to be in pristine condition and, and, and various other things and on suitable host plants or whatever. And, uh, and obviously some species were easier to source than others, um, but others were really tricky, like this ascent gem. Uh, There's only a couple of uh, two British records of that. So we had to source a photograph from overseas. Um, then we had the Minsmere Crimson Underwing, another tricky one to get a good photograph of. Um, we managed, there's only one British record of that. So again, that's a, 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 another um, photograph from a, from a European colleague. And then some common moths, remarkably, were really difficult to get good photographs of. For example, the heart and dart. Now, whether it's because, you know, it's quite a mother's moth, really, it's a bit brown and not particularly you know attractive to look at and maybe moth recorders don't and moth photographers don't think it's uh, worth the time and effort for a photo shoot but we got there in the end with uh, with an image from our very own um, or our very own ex Mark Parsons 
and scarlet tiger moth as well that was a tricky one to get a good image of as well and you know despite the fact that this moth is currently obviously is, is frequently um mistaken for a butterfly because it's so pretty and it's a day flying one and um and it's definitely worthy of a photo shoot and could be on the front cover of vogue because it's such an absolute stunner so having got all these photographs um all 860 odd of them we then had to think about how we were going to fund this, you know, fund the publication of the Moth Atlas. So we ran a, a moth auction, sort of eBay style, using a site called Jumble Bee. And we had six different auction batches and people could vote, uh, well, could bid on their favourite, favourite moth. And there were bidding wars and all sorts going on. And, uh, you know, several moths got about 20 odd, odd, odd bids. So people were really desperate to, uh, to win their moths in the moth auction. Um, we also sought funding from um, sponsors and trusts. Um, so Anglian Lepidopterist Supplies sponsored the Atlas, as did Green Wings, um, Wildlife Holidays, Habitat Aid, Nature Trek and uh, Nature's Way Foods. Um, Beds and North Hans Branch Butterfly Conservation chipped in, as did the Cecil Pink Pilkinson Charitable Trust, the Gatliff Trust, Robert Kiln Charitable Trust and also the Wild Heart Trust. So thank you to all of those people and, and all of the people that sponsored the moths in the auction as well. Over 400 people sponsored species. So that's absolutely cracking. We had no idea whether it was going to be a success or not, but every single moth was sponsored in the end. So super job. And here's a lovely little December moth given us all the eye. So where did all the data come from for the moth atlas well we collaborated with um, all the data has come from the national moth recording scheme which is the uk the isle of man and Ch channel islands recording scheme and also moths ireland and moths ireland collate all the data for moths on the island of ireland so that's the republic of ireland and also northern ireland so it's a collaborative partnership effort and there was loads of data to check and one of the first things we did was produced um, provisional distribution maps. So here's a, the, the distribution map for the green carpet. And obviously, and with three different date classes, pre-1970 are the yellow dots, blue dots were 1970 to 1999, and the black dots were records for the year 2000 onwards. And having produced these, we needed to check for dodgy dots. So we... Um, sent all the maps to a panel of regional experts and, uh, and BC staff and we spent quite a lot of time scrutinising these maps looking for these potential dodgy dots and altogether about 10,000 possible dubious records were, were highlighted for 482 species and these were all referred back to the county moth recorders because um, the only way a record can get into the national moth recording scheme is via the County Moth Recorder Network. They're responsible for the collation and verification of all their local data sets. So if you don't send your moth records to your, your County Moth Recorder, they don't go into the National Moth Recording Scheme. And a similar situation occurs in, in Moths Island with their verification panels. Um, out of those 10,000 records, four and a half thousand were retained and, and considered to be okay. 3,000 records we didn't have a response for, and 2,500 of those records on a second look, the county recorders were like, oh, actually, no, that, that is not, that's incorrect, and, and they were rejected and not included in the book. <clears throat> and we also chased up missing records for at least 80 species. So having done that and uh, checked for dodgy dots, we then had to look for potentially dodgy dates. So this chart here shows the proportion of all um, records for the lime hawk moth in two different date periods. So 1970 to 1979 are sort of the purpley, purpley grey bars and the more recent um, records are in the black of black bars 2000 to 2016. And what you can see here is you can see, you know, a clear pattern here, but what on earth are these up here and what on earth are those up down there? So this added a second level of verification and any records that fell outside of the sort of, you know, flight period, they were scrutinised again. 
So what did we find there? Well, we had about 12, this highlighted about 12,000 records for 587 species. Um, because some of the issues were due to Excel, um, Excel date formatting issues, and also the 1905 serial number, which it, for whatever reason, it, it puts in 1905 as a year um, from time to time for, for it, whatever reason. And obviously, like I said, the American date format as well was, was, was a problem. And these issues um, were, these were, these two issues affected about 4,000 records. There were also life stage and sampling method mismatches. Um, 6,000 of these um, potentially dodgy records had that. And over half of those has the, had the adult life stage as bred X. So for example, in this uh, table below here, you can see we've got a Welsh clearwing on the 8th of September, 2002. It's one count of adult, but actually when you look, it was a cocoon. So um, that adult in there is, is, is incorrect. And again, this December moth here, 30 count of adult, but they were bred X. So what really should have, that record should have cons consisted of was um, either eggs, you know, either been an egg record or a larval record caterpillar rather than 30 count of adult. So anyway, so we sorted all that out. So that was uh, that was good. Um, but I mean, when we put this, it sounds like an awful lot of records to have to double check, um, which it was. But let's get some perspective on this. And um, 12,000 out of 25 million moth records um, equates to a 0.05% error rate. So that was with the dates. And then 10,000 out of 25 million records was 0.04% of those records um, were distribution potential, you know, were distribution errors. But if we tot all this up, it only equates to 0.09%, uh, which is only 0.01% more errors than pesky species of clothes moths. And this is perhaps my favorite uh, uh, equation ever, a very simple one, because there's only two out of two and a half thousand species of moths, which can actually really damage your clothes and your carpets and such like. Anyway. So, having ironed out all these, uh, all the dirty data, we had a clean data set which we could then use to produce the final distribution maps. And as I've said, we uh, worked in partnership with Moths Ireland, and the atlas was published by Nature Bureau in on the twenty second of November, twenty nineteen. Oh, crikey, it seems so long ago now, and uh, but it just completely engulfed our lives for a long time. So what does the moth atlas feature? Well, 893 macro moth species, 867 of those um, have a species that have got a, um, a species account with them. And then we've got 26 species in the appendix. So they are, um, they are moths that have not been recorded in um, Britain or Ireland prior to, uh, not, not recorded since uh, 1970. And we've also got another appendix with the aggregates in there, which are species that are difficult to um, separate unless you look at their genitalia. So, so this is what a species account looks like. Um, so on the right here, you've got the distribution map. I'm just gonna see if I can get a pointer up here. Hang on a minute, Let's pointer options. There we go. Super, so we've got our distribution map with our three different date classes. Um, these figures here tell you the number of 10 kilometer squares the species was recorded in for each of the date, different date um, periods. And then we've got the similar um, rundown here for Ireland as well, the Irish records. Um, you've got the Great Britain distribution trend, long term trend, the short term distribution trend, the abundance trend, and also the GB red list status and the Irish red list status. And a bit of blurb about the about the species itself. Uh, space was at a premium. We only had room for something like 362 characters, including spaces. And we felt and we, we kept the text minimal, A, because we didn't have much space, but also because a lot of that information can be found in all the fantastic field guides that are out there. So we wanted to focus on like the novel information. Obviously, we've got the cracking photographs. Um, 
for each species and a flight period as well, which shows the species phenology um, <clears throat> in the two different uh, date periods. And for some species as well, we we did um, diff we did what we we made what we called um, splattergrams, and they show um, the species flight period in relation to um, uh, latitude as well. So because some species are becoming more double brooded as, as you know further north and such like so depending on what the what chart looked more interesting told a better tale determined which chart we'd use um, so as I said and we've got there we have we've got the distribution map and then last but not least down in the bottom right hand corner anybody that sponsored a moth for the moth atlas got to have a little personal dedication put in there and some of them were absolutely you know lovely their tributes to loved what you know loved ones that have moved on and, and such like so um so as a real sort of personal touch for for people so come on oh i need to press that one so how is it looking then in terms of recording intensity um or over time so the chart up here shows the number of records um, in the National Moth Recording Scheme by year. And you can see from about to the year 2000, numbers just go up and up and up and up. Um, looking at the percentage of records for the three different date periods, you can see that nearly three quarters of records, again, are from the modern period 2000 to 2016. And obviously these two chaps here, they, their, their records would go probably in the pre-1970s. and did those guys ever think that the records, those moth records that they were making and collecting back then would end up in this book? So these two are uh, utter trailblazers. And I'm glad to say that mothing attire has uh, moved on and modernized as has the uh, technology of the trap types used. Oh, come on. So let's now look then, um, this, this map here shows recording intensity at 10 kilometer square resolution from 2000 to 2016, 18.7 million records are from this time period. And basically the, the uh, map showed the darker, the darker the color, the greater, um, the greater number of records per 10 kilometer square. And, uh, SV91 in the Isles of Scilly had 184,907 records and uh, so that was the, the highest number for sort of the UK and T29 in County Wicklow had almost 45,000 records. I do believe that's where the uh, the county recorder was, uh, the county or the head, the, the guy that was running Moths Island was living at the time. So uh, and then we can look at the number of species. So species density from 2000 to 2016. And again, the darker the color, the greater number of species recorded. And you can see that as a, on, on sort of a whole, on average, there are a greater number of species in, in Southern England and the numbers sort of like whittle down as you move further north. Um, so yes, yeah, so 893 species and 761 of those were considered to be resident somewhere in the British Isles. And the 10K squares with the greatest number of records, uh, of species, sorry, was um, TRO2 in Kent with 554 species. And again, T29 in County Wicklow with 369 species. So, National Moth Recording Scheme data aren't collected in using any sort of standardised methodology. People go out and run moth traps or do daytime observations or whatever. There's no standard methodology. Some people might run their moth traps all night. Some might just run them for a few hours or whatever. And so obviously, and they're also, and also um, it's the, the National Moth Recording Scheme is basically like a Cinzano scheme. It's any moth at any time, anywhere. So, but we wanted to produce um, occupancy, uh, op op distribution trends from this. Um, and obviously they needed to take, in, uh, take into account the temporal and spatial bias in the data. Unfortunately, because the statistical approaches have improved and got much better, we could do occupancy modeling um, and it takes into account the, uh, the, 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 the temporal and spatial bias. 
So we produced robust distribution trends um, for Great Britain at one kilometre square resolution. We didn't do it for Ireland. Well, we did do it for Ireland, but on reflection, when we looked at the trends, we could see and, and we consulted with the experts in Ireland as well that the data at the moment is, is too sparse to, to generate robust trends. But it's something that can be done further down the line. So we ended up with um, long-term trends for 511 species. And when I say long-term trends, what we mean is from 1970 to 2016, or 1980 to 2016, or 1990 to 2016. And we also generated short-term trends for 559 species in their aggregates. And these short-term trends are from 2000 to 2016. So we took the standardized long-term trend from 1970 to, uh, you know, to look at the data. And, and for, for that 47 year period, what we found is that 390 species had sufficient data and 42% of these had declined in distribution, whereas 58% had increased in distribution. And the biggest loser in terms of distribution was the white colon that has declined by 94 percent. And the biggest winner was the red green carpet, which had increased its distribution by 667 percent. So. And then what we can do, so this chart here, this shows that same data again, but it also shows significant decline. So. The chart, we've got the number of species on the y-axis. I don't know why that's going all wobbly. And the, and, and the percentage change in the distribution along the x-axis. So overall, we've got 42% of species declining, 58% of species increasing. But when you actually look at significant declines, 31% of these declines were statistically significant. And these are the darker pink areas. Um, and 38% of species um, showed significant increases, and these are the darker blue bars on the chart here. And 31% um, showed no change. So let's just look at a couple of these, take a couple of examples. So here we've got the uh, Jersey tiger moth, um, which once upon a time was just found down in, in, in the southwest in Devon. Um, it didn't go anywhere for years and years. Um, it is, yeah, and, and, but since 1990, it has expanded its, uh, its distribution has increased by 861%. And you can see these black dots, these 2000 onwards records popping up all over the show and, you know, all around the London area and they're spreading north of the Thames now into, into Hertfordshire and Middlesex. And, and we've got a few dotted around up here as well. So this is a species, keep your eyes peeled, masses of reports of this moth last year. And um, you know, loads of members of the public saw this this moth. So it's 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 on the move and spreading out. Um, same can't be said for the lovely lappet, though. I've never seen one of these moths actually. Um, this one has declined by 61% in distribution since um, 1980. And again, you can see that these old historical records, the yellow and the blue dots, lots of places around here where there are no recent records, no black dots overlying these older ones. So um, yeah, it's all a bit, little bit um, depressing for, for that particular lovely moth. So that's distribution. Um, we also wanted to look at abundance and generate abundance trends. Um, but obviously we needed to do this using standardized trapping methodology so the data were comparable. So we used data from the Rothamsted Insect Survey. Um, they run a network of light traps across the UK and they've been running for, uh, for I don't know how long, quite a long time. Um, and what we did is we produced robust abundance trends for Great Britain. Again, we couldn't include Ireland because um, there aren't enough Rothamsted traps in Ireland. Um, but what we did do is manage to uh, get these generalised abundance indexes or guys for 427 macro moth species. And what do these show? 
Well, again, taking that 47 year period from 1970 to 2016, we got trends for 397 species, 62% of which had declined in abundance and 38% had increased in abundance. And the biggest loser, unfortunately, was the stout dart. Um, the last British record for this moth was in Norfolk in 2007. So it's effectively, we think it's gone extinct right under our noses. Um, whereas in contrast, um, you've got the buff footman, which was the biggest winner in terms of, of uh, abundance uh, increase, a whopping 84,589% increase in the buff footman. So, and this just basically shows this again, another chart here. So 62% of species overall declining, 38% increasing in abundance. And we've got the darker pink shows the significant trends. So 34% of those 136 species which were declining were declining. The, the, the change was statistically significant. That's really difficult to say that. Um, and whereas 11% of species showed a significant increase and um, with 35 of them more than doubling. So that's these darker blue bars. So what we then did is we took, um, we looked at long term distribution and abundance trends um, for the species that had had them for that period of nine, uh, 1970 to 2016 and there's 351 of them and we plotted them against each other. So on the X, on the Y axis here, you've got the dis logged distribution trend and on the X axis, you've got the abundance trend. And um, what we can see, and, and there's, there's, this shows um, whether they were significant in both measures or significant in abundance only or distribution only or neither. Um, but what we've got is we've got 94 species that are increasing in both abundance and distribution. Um, and also then we've got 121 species that are declining in uh, both measures. So and it's gonna be really interesting to delve a little bit deeper when we've got five minutes into this to look at what you know the actual species that are associated with these dots on here and see if we can you know pull out any conclusions um, looking at the uh, Lepidoptera traits database as well to see you know what if, if there are species in certain habitats or species um, with certain life you know, overwintering stages or whatever so that's going to be fascinating to look at further down the line. We also looked at um, the phenology as well, and we estimated the mean flight period for 405 single brooded species. We excluded winter flying moths because they cover two calendar years and it makes it all very messy. And, um, and by comparing the flight period from 1970 to 1979 with the flight period for 2000 to 2016 for Britain, Ireland and the Isle of Man, we excluded the Channel Islands because geographically they're closer to um, they're, they're closer to the continent. So excluded them. But what we found on average was that mean flight dates were almost five days earlier in 2000 to 2016 compared to the 1970s. So this chart here, number of species on the Y axis, difference in days on the X axis, and basically all of those, all of these to the left here are um, coming out earlier, and these ones to the right of this dotted line are emerging later. So again, let's take a closer look. So 81% of species are flying earlier. 12 of, 12 of those are flying at least 14 days, so two weeks earlier. For example, this species, the gray birch. And you can see here the flight chart for this species with the historical records um, in the purple there. And you can see the peak there is much later than the, than the uh, peak. Uh, in, in the modern modern period. But like I said, we we looked at mean flight dates for this. Um, and then 19% um, of species were flying later, probably because our autumns are a bit warmer. Um, and 13 of those species were at least fly, uh, emerging at least um, seven days later, for example, the pink barred sallow. And again, you can see here the, the comparison of the two different flight periods. 
Oh, and there she is, my favorite fluffy pink moth. So the atlas shows lots of changes um, going on with our, with our moth fauna. And well, what is driving that? Well, there's a potent cocktail of drivers um, driving biodiversity change. And although studies for moths are quite few and far between, it's highly likely that the, the, the general cocktail is having the same effect on moths. So one of the biggest factors is land use change. We've seen wildflower, rich, rich wildflower grasslands um, destroyed and ripped up to make, play, make room for things like these lovely agricultural monocultures and these modern housing developments. And, um, and then in, in addition to that, um, yeah, but there's some of these, yeah, but some of these, and then also we've got things like afforestation, so um, plantation, uh, planting of um, plantations, um, and that's actually been beneficial for some species. So, for example, the spruce carpet, that has shown a 557% increase in its distribution and a 3,363% increase in abundance um, due to, you know, due to, um, you know, the planting of, of conifers. So, and then if we look at this map, again, this shows the distribution map. So just look at all these black dots that are coming up, modern records dotted around all over the show, um, you know, spreading northwards uh, as, uh, you know, as the moth spreads northwards and utilizes these, you know, generally um, biodiv biodiversity poor um, habitats like plantations. Um, Blair shoulder knot is a moth that has um, experienced a, again in massive increases due to land use change um, particularly with the planting of ornamental um, different ornamental plants in, in gardens and um, so things like um, non-native cypresses and they for example leylandii this moth's gone up in, in distribution by 206 percent and a 321 percent increase in abundance so a, a clear winner there um, and the Blair shoulder knot actually was first recorded in 1951 on the Isle of Wight, and it reached um, it reached the uh, reached Ireland in in 2002. Oh, there we are. Here's the here's the map. And again, you can see these, you know, expanding all these new modern dots, Isle of Man, and then obviously across to to Ireland as well. Um, so our gardens can be, you know, really important sort of oases for, for moths and, and, and butterflies and other wildlife, particularly in, in urban areas. Um, but the latest craze for artificial grass, um, that's not going to do any good for man nor beast. And uh, so it's, my, it's like the latest thing that people are going into going in for. And I spoke to some artificial grass um, providers last year. And, you know, people are going absolutely crazy for it. And the market is growing, you know, exponentially. So um, let's let's get out there and start campaigning against this plastic stuff. And it's so popular now, this artificial grass, that there are guides on YouTube about how to clear up a tomato sauce spillage after a barbecue and also how to stop it smelling of, of, of dog wee and dog poo and such like. So um, it's it's. It's really, yeah, it's going to be the next nemesis, I think, for in our gardens. So, uh, right, so moving out towards sort of the countryside as well, countryside management's changed, um, mainly due to the intensification of agriculture. This research has shown that um, hedgerow trees and field margins are really beneficial to moths out in the countryside and also um, hedgerow management, less intensively managed hedges are again refuges for moths. So, you know, so some of this sympathetic land use management can be achieved through um, agri-environment um, agri scheme prescriptions. Changing management doesn't just apply to the machinery on the land. You've also got things like live um, stocking density. So we all know that sheep will remove everything and they nibble everything within an inch of its life. And they're quite often in high, high, high density flocks. Um, whereas um, lower intensity grazing with cows, for example, supports more moths. So none of these things are really insurmountable. We just need the political and public will to 
you know, make these changes and make things happen and improve things for our Lepidoptera. Another issue is, is nitrogen pollution. Um, you might think that it's just a rural issue with farmers spreading loads of nitrogen fertilizer on the land, but it's not. It's also an urban issue um, because of all the um, com you know, combustion of, of, of fossil fuels in vehicles and, and such like. And, um, and what they found in experiments is that um, even if you, if you apply fertilizer at the same rate would be received out in the field, then it's, yeah, basically when fer nitrogen fertilizer is apply applied to host plants at the rates typically used in agriculture, you can see that um, in, there's increased mortality in the larvae of blood veins and also, um, this is this one up here, um, and, 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 and straw dot moth as well. And also the active nitrogen in soils um, changes the chemistry and the structure and the composition of plants, which again will have knock on effects to moths. Artificial light at night is a knock on effect of urbanisation. And again, you know, it's, it's uh, artificial light at night, let's call it by its real name, it's light pollution. And light pollution is um, been shown to have affect the pheromone production in female cabbage moths. It reduces larval growth in rustic shoulder knot and also inhab inha inhibits feeding in, in some adult moths, for example, the um, common marble carpet. And also there's an, a reduction in nocturnal pollination as well in areas with high uh, light pollution. And then the other biggie is obviously is climate change and the effects of climate change. Um, it can be positive on some species and negative on others. Um, and it's in, it can increase um, species range margin. So looking at these two species, we've got the black arches here. Um, the distribution trend for that moth um, since the 1970s has gone up by 307%. And, uh, and again, the same thing can be said for the uh, red-necked footman, which has gone up by, it's expanded its range by 66% since 1990. And so the range margins of southern moths are expanding northwards and they're expanding northwards at an accelerating rate. So you can see here comparing decades from 1960s to 1970s and then 1980s to 1990s, the um, range expansion was 11 kilometers a decade. Um, but bring that forward a few years and um, the difference between the data from 1986 to 1995 compared with 2001 to 2010, that's gone up to 31 kilometres per decade. <clears throat> um, there was uh, <clears throat> a climate risk uh, assessment was, was done relatively recently and it showed that there will be net gains for um, many, many species, but there are time lags due to habitat availability. So it doesn't really matter if the climate warms up and you think, oh yeah, I'm, I'm a moth and oh, oh, it's a bit warmer up north, I can spread up north. Well, you can't really spread up north if there's no available habitat. So that's, that's you know, the, the limiting factor. Um, and climate change has also been shown to affect species phenology as well. So if we look at this moth here, the flame shoulder, um, the abundance trend of that moth uh, has gone up by 65%. And on the right here, you've got the flight chart for that moth. So again, the purple is the 1970s data and the black bars, the 1980s data. And you can see here that the moth appears to be emerging earlier now. And it also looks to be becoming more double, more, more um, double brooded. Than it was in the 1970s. So again, and that has that has the knock-on effects and, and implications as well. So, are we heading towards insect Armageddon? Does do the re moth atlas results show that that's where we're going? Well, in a nutshell, no, because we've got many more species that are increasing than are than are decreasing. But that's not to say that we need to sit on our laurels and think everything's okay, because clearly it isn't. And then let's just look at, you know, human beings and the environment. Well, there's, you know, a long history of people being concerned about the environment. We had Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, which came out in 1962. Um, Joni Mitchell was singing about putting up a, you know, putting up a parking lot 
paved paradise and put up a parking lot that was back in the night in 1970 and Marvin Gaye with Mercy Mercy Me the Ecology um, in 1971 and then obviously then there's I know it's all a bit dated I'm a bit dated I think it's because I'm a 70s kid um, and then we've got Watership Down as well the book by Richard Adams and, and then the, the movie again highlighting the plight that the bunnies had so um, so it's not news at all. And more recently, we've had um, Greta Thunberg and obviously David Attenborough banging the drum for the environment and, you know, trying to get everyone to wake up to the fact that we cannot continue to undermine our, you know, our resource base. So hopefully something will, fabulous will happen. On, on that front. I mean, it does seem to be that nature's having a renaissance and more and more people are recognising the benefits of nature. So let's hope that, you know, we can really make some positive changes. Um, uh, Butterfly Conservation launched in a, a campaign um, a what, little while ago, 18 months or so ago, called Be the Butterfly Effect. And that's all basically about the flap of a butterfly's wings can create um, storms further away so the way I look at it is like throwing a, a pebble in the pond every single action that you take is like throwing a pebble in the pond and those ripples spread out and have ramifications and um, you know and so if you don't believe me then I've got a perfect example here because we've got these all these different people here shown on the screen have been out <coughs> recording moths in various places so all those individual actions have come to form to this collective of uh, this collective outcome, which is the Atlas of Britain and Ireland's larger moths. So perhaps it shouldn't be called the butterfly effect, but perhaps we should call it the moth effect. All of the data that comes in to butterfly conservation, be it butterfly records or moth records, um, it all feeds in to inform our conservation work and la advice to landowners and such like. And I'm sure you probably saw this lovely slide in Phil's presentation earlier. So we can provide advice to landowners and local authorities and such like to improve the situation for Lepidoptera. And again, you know, all our research and it all, all the data collected informs all of our um, research and advocacy work and feeds into policy basically the records that you guys collect and submit to us are our evidence base. So quick summary of the atlas, I'm almost there. Um, moth, atlas, uh, moth recording is a really popular pastime. Um, the atlas is a type, provides a timely account of the state of our moths. It's a treasure trove to be mined. This, I'm quite sure we will find so many answers and solutions to problems if we just get the opportunity to delve into the data further. And continued recordings required because species are changing. You know, their distributions are changing, their flight periods are changing. We've got more species colonizing and such like and others going extinct so it's a constant state of flux so we constantly need to be gathering in the data so i just like to say thank you to all the county moth recorders the moth recording community conservationist researchers funders supporters and photographers and the, my colleagues and co-authors and um and our, and our partners ukch uh, nature bureau and rothamsted insect survey and also thank you to you for listening and um and if we've got time for questions i'm happy to answer some and here we are is today's special offer you can get the moth atlas for 35 pounds including postage and uh, you just need to contact malcolm hull to get yours so uh thank you very much Great. Well, thanks, Zoe. That's a fascinating talk. Um, I think we've um, we have got a little time left for questions. Um, there's, um, if there are any questions that people want answered, can you put them in the uh, in the chat box? One well, one thing I just wanted to ask was about um, uh, pesticides. You you mentioned quite a few things that were um, were bad for moths, but. The, is is the use of insecticide and 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 other pesticides a, a real problem still or has has that improved a lot in recent years the reason why i didn't really mention pesticides is because there isn't much specific research into it with moths um but i think it's highly likely that pesticide use is <clears throat> is having an effect on on them yeah okay um 
Chris Newman's asked is, are you sure that increases in abundance and distribution aren't just due to more and better recording? No, uh, yeah, definitely not due, due to that because the, the, um, this, the occupancy modelling and the generalised, uh, whatever they are, generalised abundance index, they take into account, those statistical methods take into account um, recording effort. So, um, yeah, mm. so they are real. Okay. Um, in terms of conservation of moths, um, I mean, we, we've sometimes struggled as a branch to work out what, the, what, what we could do in that area. I know a lot of effort's been put into um, sort of a priority A moths, um, which we don't have any of in our area at all. Um, and um, although though we have, um, I think the four spotted moth has been our um, the, the one where we've, uh, we've been trying to put uh, conservation effort in, although as it seems to, as far as we know, not to actually be resident in Hertfordshire at present. Um, it's, it's, we, I can't say we've had great success in that front. But um, other than generally sort of encouraging wildflower meadows and, and not too much chopping down of hedgerows and planting nice things in our garden, is, is there anything more systematic we could do as a branch to, to encourage conservation? Well, I, th I think the I think the main issue with moths is that we don't a lot of them, we don't understand their life histories. They've not had the research done on them like, you know, many of the butterflies have. You know, like with the large blue butterfly, for example, we know exactly what habitat requirements that needs and we can go out there and we can do the necessaries and see the numbers go up. But unfortunately, we don't know enough about individual species like life histories to do things like that with, with a, a big suite of moths. And I think the other thing as well is a lot of moths that are on the decline are what you would call common and widespread moths. Um, so they're sort of they're generalists, and um, and so they're going to need like m massive, massive sort of land landscape scale approaches and agri environment schemes and, and things like that. Um, so that might be so, yeah. So. In a nutshell, I don't think I'm not entirely sure that there is anything specific that you can do. Um, obviously, you've got um, what's his name? You, you've got your county recorder up there, Colin Plant for Hearts and Middlesex. Colin would be a man to have a chat to about, you know, the, these kinds of things. Yeah, quite. Right. <laughs> OK, um, let's just have a look. There's one question from Peter saying, do most of the moths emerging later rather than early occur after the summer solstice? Yes, I think they do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they're more of the, the autumnal moths. Brian's asking, why is nobody in America interested in moths? Ah, well, there is. There's a really superb bloke, actually. He spoke at our moth recorders meeting in January, and his name's um, David Wagner, and he's at uh, oh, University of Connecticut. And, um, yeah, he's, he's, he's your man. He's great, and he's written a lot of papers about um, insect declines in general and, and, and moths as well. There you go. Right. OK, well, I think that's probably um, come to an end. Thanks ever so much, Joe. Really, uh, really interesting to hear all that. And um, as Zoe said, if anyone would like to um, purchase a copy of the book, we're, we're selling it at, um, at sort of cost price. Um, so do get in touch with me if you'd like one. We've, we've, we've got about half a dozen. So um, uh, it's first come first serve but anyone that would like to um to buy a copy of zoe's book that hasn't got one already then uh, please do get in touch um okay so let's see what's next ah results of the photo competition by andrew wood andrew do you want to um see if you can share your screen i'll give it a go uh, Okay, can everyone see that? I can. Yes. And you can hear me, I hope. Yeah. You're a bit faint, but... I okay, can... let's try that. Here we go. So, as I say, thank, as it says there, thanks to everyone who entered photos and voted. So here's the big reveal, the big results. All doing well. 
So UK Butterflies, we have a joint winner. We have Glenville Fritillary and The Wall, both taken by Chris Barnes. So no problem having to do a, a playoff here because it's both the same photographer. So that, that's our UK Butterflies, which was by far the uh, largest uh, number of entries that we had in the competition. Then we go on to UK Moths, and here's the winner. And, Isn't and that Barry, yours? <laughs> it's someone that you may have heard of. Um, yes, it's my large emerald from Benjo. So thank you very much to everyone who voted for that. And then in behaviour, this is the winner, which is the female orange tip taken by Ian Flack, real action shot. And then for the non-adult, we have Ian Small's Cinnabar Moth Lava munching away on ragwort. And obviously, as we always said, for non-UK, there were no entries this year for pretty obvious reasons. So those are our winners. So thank you. That's uh, I think all I need to say, really. Great. Well, thanks very much, Andrew, for uh, organising that for us. And congratulations to all the winners. Um, I, di I didn't. I didn't hear anything about prizes, but um, no doubt you'll be in touch with Andrew about those. Yeah, that will be sorted out. Don't worry. Excellent. Cool. Thank you also to Peter Clark for getting everything up on the website as well, because I know that was a hard job as well. So thanks to Peter. Yeah, it's great. It's great to be able to run the competition. I enjoyed looking at all the photos, even though none of mine won as usual. Anyway. Um, Let's um, let's see what's next. Um, oh yeah, I just want to run um, a couple more polls. This is just really for us to get an, uh, a bit more information about um, your feelings about the meeting and how it went today and where you heard about it. So I'm just gonna put a few more questions up um, and then I'll move on after that to uh, closing remarks. Just getting that. So there's um, there's three questions here. Um, so if you could just um, look at each of them and uh, let us know your thoughts, that would be great. Cool. Well, thanks very much. That's um, looks like everyone's voted. Um, I'll just share the results. You can see that um, quite a few. Ah, oh, most people found it enjoyable and entertaining. Well, that's uh, that's probably self-selecting, isn't it? The ones that would ones that waited till the end would be the ones that were enjoying themselves. It's all the ones that left beforehand weren't. Oh, actually, I do. We didn't. We didn't have that many people leave during the course of the event. Yeah, most people heard about it from our email as well. Okay, great. Uh, just to point. Zoe's put a link to David Wagner's paper. So there's something there. If Brian's quick, he can get link onto that. I know David Wagner very well. Great. Okay. Um, right. Well, I suppose that just um, it just remains for me to um, to say thank you very much to everybody that's um, that's come today. Thank you to all our speakers. Thanks to everybody on the committee and everyone else for their hard work during the year. It's been quite an interesting session, and uh, we're certainly, I think, from the the talk that Phil's done, we will um, we will take away the idea of getting in touch with more of the local authorities um, in and around our area and see what we can do to try and um, try and get more action on that. It sounds like quite from the comments that quite a lot of the individual local, local authorities are, are actually doing 
work on this already, but I know that some have been um, discouraged by adverse reactions, and that's probably an action point for us to try and be help them be proactive in saying exactly why they're, they're stopping cutting the grass. Um, just a few things to mention before we go. Um, Roger, Roger Gibbons talk on the French Connection um, on Wednesday evening. Um, that should be very interesting and entertaining. Roger's a real expert on French butterflies, so there's a lot that we can find out um, about those in preparation for whenever it is that we're next allowed to go and visit in France. Um, our newsletter is going to come out slightly later than usual um, this, this year, probably come out in early May. This is so that we can hopefully get a bit more certainty about uh, events that we're able to use, to run during the year before we send it out. Um, and also that we can capture more of the big bus big city butterflies information. Um, we should hopefully get uh, be able to announce the staff members once, uh, once they're appointed. Um, and our events program um, should be starting towards the end of May, lockdown regulations permitting and um, we hope that we'll be able to get out in the field and see lots of you during the year. So please, um, please do feel free to get in touch with any members of the uh, any members of the committee with any ideas or suggestions or questions at any time. Um, thanks very much for coming and um, goodbye. Thank you. Before you all go, we hope to do a programme of these talks again next year. Um, any ideas for speakers will be most gratefully received. So, bye everyone. Bye. Thanks for coming. Thank you. We managed to finish before uh, five o'clock as well, which was good news. <laughs>